בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוכים הבאים, all of the uh, old faces, all the young faces, uh, for uh, everybody, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for coming, it's really mitzvot, the, uh, for a person to go to a shiur Torah in this generation at 9 o'clock at night, you should already give yourself a round of applause, because in this generation, a lot of people are so busy trying to do so many other things that they forget that the Torah is the foundation for your life. It's the instruction set. Many of us grew up not even realizing that Torah is even relevant to our day-to-day -day life. So the uh, series that we're doing on Tuesday night that we started uh, about a month ago is uh, called Igeret Aramban. Anyone who doesn't have a book, you should just grab one, it's free. It's a uh, letter of the Ramban, Nechmanides, who wrote a letter to his son almost 900 years ago. His son was still in Spain, and uh, the Ramban was in Eretz Israel. He uh, won a debate in Barcelona against the Christian church, and uh, showed them that their entire religion of Christianity is completely fake. Anyone that wants to see the entire debate, after the debate was completed, the Ramban wanted to make sure that Am Yisrael could always use this information to verify that Judaism is the only true religion, Torah is the only book from God, and most importantly, everything else is considered 100% idolatry. With the exception of Islam, which is not idolatry, but it's still considered heresy. It's still considered that they're enemies of God because of how they misinterpret the Torah. But nonetheless... The Ramban asked the church questions or presented questions to the church that until this day, almost 800 years later, no one can answer. And the reason why is because by answering them, you pretty much nullify the entire Christian religion. You destroy it completely. And in order to answer those questions, you pretty much have to admit that Christianity is complete falsehood nonsense. Now, after the church saw that the Ramban beat them, after a four-day debate, they still wanted to push their power on the Jewish people and intimidate them and pretend as if they won the debate, but the Ramban obviously did not sit quiet and he published all of the answers that he said in the debate. And after the, the church saw that, that he's doing it, they uh, pretty much put out a uh, bounty on his head and he had to flee the country, he had to flee, and he went at the age of 70, uh, he went to Eretz Israel, which it's not like today going to Eretz Israel. if any of you want to go to Eretz Israel, you just go onto the internet, buy a ticket, and tomorrow within a, about 15 to 20 hours, you're in Eretz Israel. In those days, there was no such thing, you would simply go on a donkey, and hope you're going to survive half the trip, not even the whole trip. So he arrived in Eretz Israel. But once he arrived in Eretz Israel and he settled down, he was only there for a few years, he decided to send a letter to one of his, to his, uh, one of his sons. And uh, this letter is a, uh, simply the Ramban giving his son instructions of how to live life. If you guys can pay attention to this shoe, it's going to be much more beneficial than your phone. I promise you. Now, if the Ramban is writing a letter to his son, He's not writing a letter, A, hey, how are you, how's the kids, how's your wife, what'd you do this weekend, you still play soccer a little bit. He didn't write one of those letters. He wrote letters to his son to explain to him simply instructions of how to live a good life, which is something that in today's world is virtually unheard of. Most people believe they have a good life because they have fun once in a while. They go to watch a movie that scares them or makes them laugh. They find a new girlfriend or a new wife every other day. They have a kid. Sometimes they find out it's not even theirs. They get married shortly after they get divorced. Then they get married again. And if you want to be a celebrity, you have to be married at least and divorced at least five times. Once you're married and divorced five times, then you can become a celebrity. They try some drugs, maybe to take their mind off of their stress, and then they realize that the drugs actually create new stress and new problems. They buy a dog, they give the dog away, because once they realize they have to pick up after the dog, they realize it's not that much fun, like it looks like in the TV. And people constantly try to do things to occupy their time, 
playing video games for hours and hours upon hours, watching TV for hours after hours after hours, and telling everybody, oh, did you see the uh, new series, uh, Lost, Schmost, all these different series, did you see it? Yeah, I spent the whole weekend watching uh, season one. I watched the whole week. Oh, so what'd you get out of it? Oh, it was great. Okay, so what'd you learn out of it? Well, nothing, really. I learned absolutely nothing that I could use for real life, unless I get stranded on an island, and there's a smoke that's chasing me. And uh, other than that, to run away from the smoke that's chasing me on the island, you really can't learn anything from that. But you spend 12, 15, 20 hours watching it. I mean, if you're going to invest 20 hours into something, you should have some type of benefit. Have something. Oh, I didn't think about that. You're going to watch season two? For sure. Maybe I'll learn something on season two. Maybe there's a different kind of smoke. Maybe uh, one of them is going to get married. Maybe one of them is going to kill the other. And people spend an enormous amount of time wasting their life doing things that have zero benefit. Why? They need to occupy their minds. They need to occupy their time. And they need to somehow feel, even if it's a momentary feeling, like they're having fun. But yet, statistics show that that system doesn't work. Why? How do statistics show it? Right now, in the Western society, which is in essence considered the richest society in the world, which you would think is the happiest, because that's what people think creates happiness. They think money creates happiness. So the richest society in the world also has the highest rate of depression. Every other kid is considered someone that has attention deficit disorder. Every kid. Every kid in school is attention deficit disorder. Tell me, oh, why don't you come to Shu? No, no, I'm sorry, Rabbi, I can't. Why not? I have ADD. What do you mean you have ADD? Why do you think you have ADD? No, the psychiatrist told me I have ADD. I said, why? He says, oh, because I can't sit down for a while. No, that just means you're impatient because you play a lot of video games and you like immediate, uh, immediate benefits for anything you do. Sit there for a little while, get the point, pay attention. After a while, you'll like it. No, I have ADD. They put me in a special class. What class they put you? With special ed kids. That they, uh, My classmate's 39 years old. My teacher is 170 and there's a horse in the class. We're not really sure if he's human, though. I have ADD. Every kid has ADD. Every other parent is the parent of the ADD kids on Prozac. Why? He's depressed. His kids on ADD. And the father regrets that he had to take Viagra. And everybody, everybody's on some type of drug to do something. Why? They figure they can't run their life without something. You have an addiction? What are you addicted to? Painkillers. You have any pain? No. So how would you get addicted to painkillers? I don't know. Somebody told me it gives you a little high. Okay, well, you got the high. Now, why would you continue? I tried again. Okay, so why would you continue? I tried again. Why would you continue? I got addicted. How long have you been addicted? Five years. How many pills you take? 27 pills a day. Now, you realize that even the guy that actually has pain, the one that has pain, doesn't take 27 pills a day. You realize that, right? You realize the amount of pills that you take every single day should kill you. So the fact that it doesn't kill you every single day, you should do sudat odaya. Give a special saudat to Hashem. Thank you, Hashem, for not killing me today. Why? I took 27 painkillers and I didn't die. The, pain, the guy that's dying, he didn't take 27 painkillers, but I took 27 painkillers. Why did you take painkillers? I was bored. And that's what Shlomo Melech says. Boredom leads to sin. We live in a generation of bored people. Every two seconds we check our phones because we hope that somebody send us a text message or somebody made a post on Facebook or Twitter or Schmitter or something on the internet. Something happened somewhere else that we can have the highlight of the moment. What? Press like. Press like. What'd you, did you like it? Yeah. Oh, why don't you like my page? They get upset. Your friends get upset at you. How come you didn't like my page? Why, you're not friends with me anymore? Why, you didn't like my post? Oh, I didn't see it. I was working. Oh, you're working now, huh? You're working. Yeah, you're one of those people. You work. You're like that. That's, that, 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 that's, that, 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 that's it right now. That's it. 20 years with friends, but now you work. You, have, you don't have time for me anymore because you work. You can't see my post that I posted the best movie of the year. What'd you post? I didn't see it yet. Oh, you didn't see it even. Even after. Now you didn't like it. You didn't even see my post. What'd you post? You didn't see the post. Okay, you know what? This time I'll let you go. What'd you post? It's so important post. Oh, you didn't see it. 
in Australia, these two cops stop traffic to let a few geese pass the road. I got 8 million views on YouTube because there's 8 million other losers in the world also pressing like. This is our days. We wait for text messages, we wait for Facebook posts, we wait for something. Why? Because we have nothing, nothing going on here. Nothing is stimulating our minds, so we have to stimulate it ourselves. And if it's not the Facebook post and the phone texts and all emails, 5 million emails a day, what is it? We have to replace it with drugs. We have to go and start day trading. Every, every uh, average Joe became a day trader. Bitcoin, Schmidtcoin, all this stuff. I was in the business for 16 years. On day one, someone told me what Bitcoin is. I said, it's a scam. It's all going to go to zero. Bo Hashem, last a year and a half ago, I told you guys going to go to zero. It almost went to zero. I recovered now. People are having a second chance. Second chance what? Not to make money, to get out. Hashem has mercy on you. Get out before it's really zero. But no, no one wants to listen. 16-year veteran on, on Wall Street, you don't want to listen to. You're going to listen to yourself because you read a few Facebook posts that somebody says it's good. People need some type of immediate relief, immediate stimulation. So they day trade, they turn their business into day trading. He used to sell toilet paper, now he decides that he wants to buy and sell containers. He doesn't know what's in a container, but he's going to buy and sell it. One day he's going to realize the container is empty and the customer knows it and all of his money is gone. But no. And this also affects us. It affects our marriage. It affects how we raise kids. It affects our day-to-day -day life. And this is part of the reason of why people are so depressed, why almost 90% of the people you're going to meet are depressed. Some clinically depressed, some just complaining nonstop. They might as well be depressed. You ask him, how are you doing? He starts telling you a slew of problems that he has. A slow problem. This didn't happen. This didn't happen. This didn't happen. I should have been this. I should have been there. I should have done this. 500 million things. He's not happy about a single thing in his life. Yeah, but didn't you just get married last week? Yeah, yeah, I got married. But, you know, now I have to pay the bill. $100,000 bill. I'm going to get the money for hundred. So why would you have a wedding for $100,000 then? If you can't pay $100,000, why would you have a wedding for $100,000? Well, what do you think? I'm uh, homeless? Well, how can I get married without a $100,000 wedding? Who gets married without a... Regular people get married without a $100,000 wedding. You just go to the Rabbanut, have 10 people, maybe a little bit of uh, shakshuka, maybe a little bit of, uh, you know, some big goods over here. You're finished. No, $100,000. Why? Show off. Show off. You want to make sure that everybody remembers your wedding. But I can tell you, for any of you that didn't get married yet, I could save you some money. How? Listen to this advice and you're going to save yourself the money. No one will remember your wedding for good. The only thing that people remember about your wedding is how bad the food was, how bad the band was, if you had a band, how you did, the bride and groom didn't pay attention to them, or how she didn't look good, or how she looked terrible, or how this. Or, all people remember is complaints. Why? Because they've conditioned themselves to such a miserable life, they can't see good, even if it's staring at them in the face. And even if they see good, they appreciate it for a moment, and they move on to something else. So, divorce rates right now in America, in some places, are over 90%. 90%. Like, for example, if you go to Colorado, you have certain cities within Colorado in the 90% success, uh, failure ratio. Meaning that if you, any one of you that never went to a class to learn how to fly a plane, you decide tomorrow, you know what, I'm going to take on a new hobby. What? I'm going to go break into El Al. I'm going to go break into American Airlines, okay? I'm going to break into, take one of these 747s. I'm just going to feel like, see what happens. You actually have a higher chance of succeeding, flying it, landing it, than actually marriage in America. You have a much more higher success ratio. You never went to school. Why? Because people believe that if it doesn't work right away, it must, be, uh, it must be something wrong. They don't believe in fixing things. She yelled at him. He wants to divorce her. She, he yelled at her. That's it. He's a dog. Throw him out with the garbage. Yeah, but he just yelled at you once. Maybe you deserve to be yelled at. Maybe he deserves to be yelled at. Why don't you just work it out? Why don't you have a discussion? Like talk like your people. I'll text her. I'll text her. I'll, you know what? 
I think she got mad at me. Why? I didn't like her post on Facebook. <laughs> this, is our, this is our lives today. This is, it's like a joke, but it's real. Our lives have turned into a joke. Assimilation in America where Jews are marrying non-Jews on the best case scenario where you see, for example, places that have more Jews and more Beknesset and more Yeshivot, 70%, 72%. Meaning the religious places, so-called religious places in America, over 70% of Jews are marrying Goyim. Meaning we are one generation away from no more Jews. In places where it's predominantly reformed, over 90% into marriage. Jews are marrying Goyim. This happened once in history. And as I've told all of the old people here, I'll remind the new ones. Or I'll tell the new ones and remind the old ones. When did this happen in history? Same exact thing. When did it happen? Right before the Holocaust. Right before the Holocaust, the intermarriage rates in the country, all over Europe, especially Germany, hit sky-high rates to the extent where the Jews of Germany said that Berlin is the new Yerushalayim for them. So with that being said, when you see that clearly, no one here can look in the mirror and honestly say, I'm happy. Unless you've been coming to the shurim for at least a year, you can't look in the mirror and say you're happy. Why? You don't even know how to. You don't know how to. You could fake it to yourself, but in reality, the next day you're crying again. The next day you're, 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 you're miserable again. No one can say. Why? Because people don't know what happy is. What is happy? Happy, Rabotai, is not really a feeling, it's a state of mind, it's an existence. You are happy and fulfilled about your life just because. It doesn't mean you don't have problems. If you don't have problems, that means you're probably dead. Because once you're dead, there's no more problems, at least not in this world. You have new problems in the next world. But in this world, if you don't have problems, you're not alive. Everybody has problems. Happiness does not mean you don't have problems. Happiness means you're fulfilled. Happiness means that you have a state of mind that you are achieving a significant purpose in your life at all times sometimes that purpose is better than others more significant than others but nonetheless you never feel like what's the point of life why should i live you never make stupid statements like every other kid makes today ah, i wish i was dead every other day i have a kid send me a text message say ah, i wish i was dead why ah, i don't know i don't know and they don't even know why they're just depressed If you understood that happiness is a state of mind, that means that you would understand that in order to test yourself whether you're happy or not, that means that tomorrow morning when you wake up, you're as excited to wake up as if you won the lotto. Without the lotto, though. If you win the lotto, you have to give masil. <laughs> you wake up in the morning as ecstatic as ever. You're in pain, but you're still happy. You're uh, tired, you're happy. You're single, you're happy. You're married, even more happy. You have kids jumping on your head, happy. No kids, happy. Bankruptcy, happy. Won the lotto, ha everything. Regardless of what's happening, you're, up, you're happy. Happy to wake up, happy to go about your life, happy to go talk to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. happy to go do whatever it is that you're doing. But happy to the extent that even if what you're doing stopped, for example, if your career ended for whatever reason or another the happiness would not change if you're happy because you like your job and you like your wife and you like your kids that means it doesn't mean you're happy it just means you're content with the situation that you have happiness means you would be happy with or without everything that you have why because you know that your entire existence is playing a role in a bigger picture Without a Kadosh Baruch Hu, it is impossible to attain that type of happiness. So the Ramban wrote a letter to his son giving him instructions. Of course he tells him to go learn Torah. Of course he tells him to go respect other people. Of course he tells him to go do a lot of things. But he specifically worded the letter that you can learn something from each and every single one of the words. Not just the whole letter. And that's what we're trying to study. 
we're trying to study why did the Ramban, one of the biggest giants in history, one of the smartest men that ever lived, decide to use these words versus anything else. So the Ramban starts even before he starts the actual letter. We went over last week that we went over the first half of the Pasuk. He, he chose to start the letter with a heading, a title, if you will, where he used the Pasuk from the book of Proverbs that Shlomo HaMelech, the wisest man of all time, wrote. Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 8, saying, Shma b'ni musar avicha v'al titosh torat imecha. He says, heed my son, the discipline of your father, and do not forsake the guidance of your mother. So last week we went over the first half of this verse. We said, why did he start with this verse where he says, heed my son, the discipline of your father. And to summarize the entire issue of last week, we could simply do it with one story. In Judaism, we have 620 mitzvot. 613 from the Torah, that are from God, and seven from the rabbis, from the sages. Not the, the rabbis of today, the rabbis of 2,000 years ago. There's no new laws coming into practice today anymore, unlike what people think. You're not allowed to make a new halacha. Any halacha that's, for example, passed on today, for example, if you see a book that says such and such, it's not a new halacha. It's just an innovation of something that already exists. It's just showing you how to use the, you know, the original halakha from 2,000 years ago and apply it to something that just came into the world today. For example, phones or uh, electricity and so on and so forth. Or like, for example, this one tipesh, this one fool, calls himself a rabbi, says that uh, if you uh, make uh, uh, clones of, uh, use, uh, use uh, technology to, to make clones of pigs, then it's kosher. Because the real pig is not kosher. There's no way to make a pig kosher. But if you make a clone of a pig, technically, he wasn't born from a mother. It wasn't, uh, so you make a clone, so he deemed it kosher. And people are surprised. Wow, I can eat pig? No, you're not allowed to eat pig. He's the only moron that says it's allowed. Nobody else says it's allowed. And you don't listen to one rabbi. You listen to Klal Yisrael. You listen to the sages. Now, one of the rules that we have is that you must rebuke your fellow if you see a fellow Jew violating Shabbat and you have a relationship with him. You know who this person is. It's not like some stranger. You know it's your friend, it's your cousin, it's a member of your kilah, maybe part of your school. And you see him, he's uh, lighting a cigarette on Shabbat. You have an obligation from the Torah to go tell him this is not allowed on Shabbat. Now, you can do it in a lot of different ways. It's a nice way, there's a mean way. But Torah says, no, no. You can't go and have this rebuke that you're telling him to do so that he's doing something wrong lead you to sin. Meaning, you can't just go out there and just embarrass anybody that's making a sin. There's a way to do everything. And that's what the Ramban says. Shema b'ni musar avicha. You have to first and foremost make sure that this person that's violating Shabbat he is attentive. Like if you say to, something to him, he's not one of these people that hates you, that regardless of what comes out of your mouth, he's not going to listen to you just because he doesn't like you. Or perhaps he's your parent, and your parents, no matter how uh, smart you are, they're always going to remember when you were in diapers. So they're probably not going to listen to you either. Make sure that this is a potential customer, not just somebody that's definitely not going to listen to you. Shema. Shema meaning make sure that whoever you're going to rebuke has an attentive ear. Doesn't mean that they're definitely going to do what you say, but at least they'll listen to what you say. They'll respect what you say. Second, remember, Musal, which is ethics, character development, is the foundation of our Torah. And the Rashi says on Gemara Masechet Shabbat that Musal is like saying Torah. It's synonymous. It means the same thing. Say Torah, say Musal, it means the same thing. Why? Because the entire Torah is supposed to teach you Musal. It's supposed to teach you ethics. Supposed to teach you how to become a better human being. So what happens when you see sometimes these so-called religious people do horrible things, steal, uh, rape, pedophiles? There's no end to the horrible things that so-called religious people on the news do. What do you do with that? 
if you see somebody that looks religious in a casino, somebody that looks religious in a uh, club, somebody that looks religious doing something terrible, he's not religious. He's just wearing a costume. Some people wear a costume once a year. Some people wear a costume every day. He's not religious. He's a faker. Don't blame God for that. Don't blame the Torah for it. Torah says it's not allowed. If a person is doing something against the Torah, we have a problem. Your job is to use the Torah to become a better quality person. And that is by learning Musab. But then he says, if you're going to go and tell somebody, Musal, nobody really likes to be told what to do. Nobody really does. Even if he likes you. Even if he's your student. Even if he's your chavrut or your study mate. He doesn't like you telling him what to do. Nobody likes it. Part of the reason of why I never really uh, stayed very long working for anybody is because I don't like to be told what to do. So I would work for somebody. I'd make them a bunch of money. But eventually, I would leave. Why? Because I want to do my own thing. While I'm working for you, I'll be the best employee in the world. I'll work hard, I'll be honest, I'll never steal. Not time, not money, not nothing. But you should know from day one, I don't plan on being forever. Why? I don't want to. And that's what I would tell every single time I would work for somebody. They would ask, what's your intentions here? I would say, buy you out. And you know, it's cute. You know, a little kid saying you're going to buy out this guy that's in the business for 20 years. Well, a few times it happened. Anyway... No one likes to be told what to do. So if you want to give somebody advice in order for them to improve their life, you have to treat them as if you're a father figure. Not that you are above them. Not that you're even equal to them. Not that you're their father, per se. But meaning you have to show them love. What is this like? There was one time a Israeli chutzpan, which there's a lot of them, Baruch Hashem, Am, Am Yisrael is Am Kshe Orif, a lot of uh, rude people sometimes, especially when they don't, they don't have Torah. So it was one guy that uh, decided that, uh, yeah, this Torah, it sounds real, sounds good, but I don't know, I'm reading in the Torah, he says, I'm reading in the Torah that there's somebody named Hillel, Hillel Azakin. Hillel was Kodesh Kodeshim, he never got angry, he was holy, he prayed to Hashem. Is there such a person as Hillel today, 3,000 years later, 2,000 years later? He says, if there's a person like Hillel in our generation, I'll do tshuva. But if there's no person in the generation like Hillel that's righteous like him, then why should I do tshuva? If everybody's reshaim, why, Hashem's going to kill everybody? That's what everybody says. Why, Hashem's going to send everybody to get home? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. If everybody's a, if everybody's a rasha, I'll send everybody to get home. He did it already. It's called Noah, generation of Noah. Sodom and Gomorrah. Plenty other times in the Torah. Point is that he says, if there's nobody in a generation like Hillel, why should I do tshuva? So why did he decide to do this chutzpah, this rude person, this arrogant person? He decided, I'm going to test the rabbis. He got a phone book with the names of the puskim in Eretz Yisrael, all the big rabbis. He decided to call them at 2 o'clock in the morning. Not 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2 o'clock in the morning. Hello? Yeah. Rabbi? Yes. Um, listen, if I have sugar on my apple, do I have to... What blessing do I have to do? Is it etz or is it shakol? Now, obviously, these rabbis are still human beings. Call them at 2 o'clock in the morning. They're not exactly ecstatic. Well, you, you know, unless you're a teenager, no, you don't want anybody calling you at 2 o'clock in the morning. So a lot of the rabbis hung up the phone on him. So he's going one after another, after another, after another. They keep hanging up on him or nobody's answering the phone. He got to the last rabbi. He says, if this rabbi doesn't become Hillel, I've done my job, Hashem. I tried. I've done my job. He calls the number. Hello? This is... This is... Mordechai Eliyahu, how can I help you? Arab Mordechai Eliyahu was the Gdolado, head rabbi of Eretz Yisrael, meaning he just called the biggest rabbi in the world at 2 o'clock in the morning, 2.30 in the morning. And Arab Mordechai Eliyahu says, hello, this is Mordechai Eliyahu, how can I help you? And the guy says, oh, Rabbi, 
if I'm e if I have an apple and there's some sugar on it, which bracha do I do? Do I do the etz? Do I do shakol? And he's expecting the rabbi to hang up on him or say, no, chutzpah, you call me at 2 o'clock in the morning, what's the matter with you? Call tomorrow at a normal time. Rabbi Mordechai, he always says, oh, my son, that's a very good question. He says, see, in the Torah, we have tafel and ikal. We have something that's insignificant and something that's significant. And he starts giving him a shiur about which bracha to do at 2 o'clock in the morning. And he's so patient with them. He says, listen, if you're going to eat the sugar separately from the apple, then you do shakol and you do the etz. But you first bless the etz. But if you're going to eat it together, since the sugar is insignificant in comparison to the apple, you just do sha'etz and it includes the sugar as well. And he's giving him a shiur, ooh, a half hour shiur. But why to do this blessing at 2 o'clock in the morning? He says, any more questions, my son? And he says to him, you know, Rabbi, I have to tell you the truth. And he tells him the whole story of why he called. He tells him the whole story of why he called. And he says, I was looking for a reason of why I shouldn't do tshuva. But apparently we do have a Hillel in our generation. And because of you, tomorrow, I'm going to start going to yeshiva. Why? Why did Rav Mordechai Eliyahu have such a merit? Because he knew, yes, you can yell at people. Yes, you can scream at people. Yes, you can do a lot of things. But you have to know when, how, and who. Most importantly, regardless of what shita you're going to use, regardless of what strategy you're going to use, some is a loud voice, some is a low voice, some is uh, with jokes, some it's with scary stories, some it's straight to your face, some it's behind your back, whatever it is. Make sure you act with love. This is the confusion that a lot of people have when it comes to Musab. They think that if you're screaming and fire and brimstone, that means you hate people. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. If you're telling people things, you spill your guts, you tell people, please do tshuva, or this is going to happen, or that's going to happen, what are you telling people? Please do tshuva, because I'm trying to warn you. There's a fire, it's on the way. If you don't get out of the way, you're going to get burned. This Rabotai was last week's shoe. This week we're going to continue on the second part of the Pasuk. Now, I have some stories, B'zad Hashem, today that we're going to tell Tonight's Shiu is going to have quite a few stories, more than usual. Some of them are probably going to make you emotional if you still have a heart in your body. Um, and uh, some of the things, some of the stories are simply going to make probably every woman here cry. Maybe some of the men. But most importantly, it'll give you some type of understanding of where you come from. Why? Because today, we're going to talk about the second half of the Pasuk and see why he says, V'al titosh torat imecha. Don't forsake the guidance of your mother. Now, The Chachamim say in the Gemara, Masechet Ketubot, that why does it say, Al titosh Torah Timecha, don't forsake the guidance of your mom. The Gemara, in, I'm sorry, Masechet Kedushin, Kedushin, page 31a, says that naturally a son is more scared of his father. Naturally, a son is more scared of his father. So the Torah says, the commandment of honoring your parents is an obligation that you have for both your mom and your dad. But here we have a pasuk in the Torah, in Sefer Vayikra, chapter 19, verse, 30, verse 3. Ish imo ve'aviv tira'u it says, a person has to be afraid of his mom and his dad. 
keep Shabbat, observe Shabbat, because I am God, I am your God. So the Chabim say, how come here, unlike the Ten Commandments, where it talks about Shabbat, it says you shall observe Shabbat. When it talks about honoring your parents, it says you should honor your father and your mom. Why does it here say that you should be afraid of your mom and dad? How come the order changed? How come here it's mom and dad and not like it was in the other pasuk, dad and mom, father and mom? He says because naturally a man is scared of his father. A boy is scared of his father, much more than his mom. And the Torah says you have to be uh, honor both of them, but you also have to be scared of your mom too. Why? Because if you're not scared of your mom, if you don't have yira, and I'm talking about a re- healthy yira, not scared that she's going to kill you while you're sleeping, healthy yira mm-hmm. that you give her respect, then you simply are the most ungrateful person on earth because you don't even understand where you came from. Now, the Chachamim also say that the, when it talks about the discipline of your mom, it's also referring to the second half of the Torah. We have, Baruch Hashem, when, the Torah, when it says in the Torah that we got Torah, it says Torot. Torot is plural, for more than one. What's Torot? Torot means that we got a written Torah and an oral Torah. The written Torah is the five books of Moses. That we all know. Hopefully we've all read at least once with commentary, if not more. And most people say, yeah, I don't have any problem with Torah. I understand it's from God. Where do we, fe- where do we see the problem? The problem we see is with the oral Torah. Why? Because the oral Torah is the one that explains the written Torah and explains how to fulfill the mitzvot. So even though you're going to see a lot of people say, oh, I believe in a Torah, but they still drive on Shabbat. I believe in a Torah, but they're still married to Goya. I believe in a Torah, but she's still dating uh, some guy from uh, Honolulu. You know, I believe in a Torah, but they still eat shrimp. Wait, but you say you believe in a Torah. Yeah, I believe in a Torah. I believe God gave me a Torah. Okay, but Torah says that you're not allowed to do these things. I don't remember reading it. I don't remember reading it. Where, where does it say? You show him a pasuk. It's like, ah, I don't, maybe you're misinterpreting it. No, the interpretation is in the oral Torah. Ah, yeah, the oral Torah, it's rabbis maybe, maybe they made it up, maybe this, maybe that. And that's what this pasuk is trying to tell us. When you're going to give honor for the Torah, you have to understand the Torah is either all or nothing. It's either you honor both the written and the oral Torah, or it's as if you've honored nothing. This perhaps is the problem that the Christians have. The, uh, also the Arabs have. And really, anyone that does not follow the Torah but says he believes in it, they call it the Old Testament, they call it the Bible, whatever they call it, different names they call it, but they don't follow it. Why? Because they say, no, this oral Torah, oral Torah is, a, uh, is difficult because it says rabbi's names, and it wasn't uh, given at Mount Sinai. The reality is that it was, and there's many, many proofs of it. But more importantly... HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to understand that this written and oral Torah is no different, you're supposed to have a relationship to it, no different than the relationship that you have with your mom. Meaning that you always have to remember where you came from, you always have to remember who and what you're all about. If you don't know where you're from, you don't know where you're going. And when a person simply just acts as if the past is irrelevant, his future is in, dire, is in danger. Now, in Russia, during the time of Stalin, Imachimo, first, for anyone who doesn't know history, Stalin was one of the worst war criminals in history. During World War II, during the Holocaust, first he was a partner in crime with Hitler, and then he went to war with Hitler. During the same war, first couple of years they were partners, and then they went to war with each other. It was a mental battle between him, Churchill, Hitler, Imachimo, and Roosevelt. Very interesting stuff. But everybody knows that Stalin was one of the worst people on earth. He was a very vicious person that ruled with the type of fear that will, you know, will 
make you shake if you understood what he did to his own people. When he saw himself losing in war, he made a law. Any soldier that surrenders to the Nazis, surrenders. Why are you surrendering? You're surrendering because you don't want to lose your life. And you know that if you continue fighting, you're going to die. So why die? Just surrender, go to jail until the war is over, then maybe they'll release you, but the point is, at least you're alive. That happens in every war. It says any Russian that surrenders is considered a traitor. And as soon as he comes home, back from the Nazi jail, we're going to kill him. His own leader is going to kill him for surrendering. Insanity. Story goes, one time Stalin lost his pipe, his smoking pipe. Looking for it, looking for it. At the end of the day, he asked one of uh, one of his uh, generals comes. He goes, "Okay, is what we have so far. Ten people admitted to stealing it. Two were still working out details to see what they admit, and there's a hundred more that are up for questioning tomorrow." The fear of the people was so extraordinary, they would literally just say, okay, what, you want me to do it? You want me to do it? Okay, fine, just kill me. Just kill me. He lost his pipe. By the way, he found it. No, no one stole it. No one stole a stupid pipe. But the people were so afraid of him that, what? He wants to kill us? Okay, you know what? I'd rather die for a crime I didn't commit because if I don't do it, he'll probably kill everybody. That's how much of a psychopath he was. During his time, it was illegal to be Jewish. It was illegal to do a Brit Milah. Jews that wanted to do a Brit Milah had to break the law. Part of the reason of why was because there was a lot of wicked Jews at the time that started an organization called Yevsekzia. Yevsekzia was comprised of communist Jews that were some of the worst people on earth. No different than Nazis. And these communist Jews hated Judaism. Their primary primary joy in life was to kill rabbis, kill religious Jews, destroy religion, burn books, and so on and so forth. I know this is probably news to many of you, but this is reality. I did a whole show about it. It's history. It's not something, it's not uh, propaganda or something. Now, it was illegal to be a Jew, but real Jews find a way to be a Jew. There was one tzaddik that was known as the Moel. He was the guy that was giving Brit Milah in secret. So, because he never knew, there's no like, hey, uh, hey, Rabbi, how are you? Can you come at 8 o'clock tomorrow? There was nothing like that. There was nothing like that. What was it like? Rabbi, baby's right here, please. He's hidden under the, under the tent over here. Come on, quickly. That's how the Rabbi was. He had his, his tools, his knife on him at all times. At all times, he was ready to give Brit Milah at any given moment. That was the deal. Why? There's no appointment, there's no ulam, uh, you know, hall, party, have some, uh, have some chulent, have some, uh, some cake, some, ca- you know, nothing like that. You are putting your life in danger. They catch anybody here involved, everybody dies. There's no prison sentence. For Brit Milah. One day, a Russian general pulls him over and says, get in. Get in the car, get in the jeep. The rabbi said, okay, started saying Shema Yisrael, this is the end of my life. One of the soldiers of Stalin pulled me over and he's driving, ooh, he's driving out of town. He's driving out of town, he's driving. I said, okay, so he's probably going to torture me. He's thinking of all the tortures this guy's going to do to him. He's scared the poor guy. He's thinking, what are they going to do to me? Why he's driving so, just kill me here. Ah, he's quiet the whole time, quiet the whole time. Eventually they get out of the town he pulls over and st- in front of this small little house. He's, the general looks at him. He says, go inside. Do what you have to do and come right back out. Rabbi, surprised. Gets out of the car. Goes inside. He sees a woman. And she has a little package. And the package is a cute little Jewish baby. He says, you're the rabbi who's going to do with me, la? He says, yes. Takes out his knife from the hidden compartment in his jacket. He does the bleating line a couple of minutes, leaves, goes back into the Jeep. Not a single word in the car. Nothing. No, oh, who's your parents? Where are you from? He's scared that this guy's probably going to kill him anyway. He doesn't even know how this all happened. But he couldn't hold himself. 
at the end of the ride, right before he threw him out of the car, he said, okay, go back to your life. Thank you. For that, the rabbi says to him, why? Why? You're a soldier for Stalin. Why did you care enough to put your life in danger, your wife's life in danger, your kid? For what? And the smart general says, I know this communism stuff, this anti-God stuff, it's not going to last forever. And I want my son that if one day he wants to go back to being a Jew, he wants to go back to being a Torah-based Jew, at least he'll have a sign on his body to remind him that he belongs there. I'll give him a choice. He wants to be a communist, he'll be a communist. But at least he'll have a choice. Meaning, Rabotai, every normal person that's old enough eventually realizes you cannot abandon your past. You cannot just say, ah, I don't connect to Moshe Rabbeinu. He, he didn't have an iPhone. He didn't have an iPad. He doesn't even know what Facebook is, this Moshe Rabbeinu guy. So I'm not connected to him. He probably doesn't understand the struggle of this, of this, uh, of living in Aventura where every girl walks around naked. He probably doesn't understand. Well, Shlomo Amalek says nothing new is under the sun. All the sins in the world that you guys can commit today were available also 3,300 years ago. Quite frankly, many of them were committed 3,300 years ago. Nothing new is under the sun. Only difference today is today you can do it digitally. Other than that, it's the same thing. So everybody understands that in order to connect, in order to connect to your past, you have rules. Rule number one, most important, don't forsake your past. Don't forsake your mother. Don't forsake who and what you came from. Don't just say, you know what? It's not for me. You know what? I don't have time for it. You know what? I don't relate. Don't just say it doesn't matter. Don't treat it as if it's not important. Why? Because there's going to come a day where Kadosh Baruch Hu is going to put you in a situation where he's going to say, yes, it is important. It is extremely important, and hopefully it's not too late at that point. When you hear it from me, it's painless. Maybe you don't like my voice, maybe you don't like the way I look, but in reality, it's painless. You're going to get free sushi in a little while, too. It's painless. You hear it from Hashem, it's not painless. Most of the time, it's very painful. And for anyone who know, wants to know a little bit of a, a smidgen, of how painful it can get. It can get much more painful, but it can get. All I recommend is you listen to my personal story. It's on our website. It's called From Wall Street to the Western Wall, or another lecture it's called a, um, Hashem Took Back His Millions and Gave Me a Munai Instead. There's a couple of names to my personal story on the internet. I actually gave my personal story here about a year and a half ago or so. And I promise you, that if you wait for Hashem to wake you up, you're not going to be happy when He does. Now, there are a few things that violate rule number one, meaning that if a person does them, he forsook the Torah, he abandoned the Torah, he abandoned Hashem. He is putting himself where he is saying, it all doesn't matter to me. And those things are called Isur Karet. There are 36 sins in the Torah that are probably not on your phone as you're looking at it. 36 of them that are in the Torah. That if you fulfill, if you make those sins, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you and me are disconnected. You and me are disconnected until you fix this problem. You and me are disconnected until you fix this problem. I'll give you a few examples of what a Yisur Karet is. Yisur Karet puts your Jewish status, spiritual Jewish status, on suspension. Puts your heaven on suspension. If a person dies without doing tshuva for Yisur Karet, no heaven, ever. If a person 
lives his whole life without doing tshuva and he has isu karet on his, under his belt, he has a very, very serious and permanent problem. I'm not going to give you the details, but I can just tell you it's not pretty. There's a few of them. One is isu nida. Being with a woman that's nida. A woman that has not gone to the mikveh. Now most people think, oh yeah, well I'm not married, so I don't have to worry about my wife going to the mikveh because I don't even have a wife. If you're married, you have to wait half the month. Your wife has a period. After she has a period, she has to wait seven days, seven clean days. And after she has seven clean days, she goes to the mikveh, and then you're allowed to be together. So approximately, you could be together half the month, approximately. Some more, some less, depending on her hormonal balance and so on. Now, if you touch your wife, not just intimate, but if you touch a finger, just a finger, you give her a kiss on the cheek, you give her a hug. Hey, honey, how are you? Give her a nice hug, like she's one of your football buddies. Hey, what's up? Give her a high five. You do that, it's called nida. If you touch the nida, it's isu karet. You have a very serious problem. Now, most people think, oh, Ishtabak Shema, I'm only 18 years old. I don't have a problem. I don't have a wife. Ah, good for me. No, that's the problem. That's the problem is that you don't realize the problem. Why? If you, if you don't have a wife, that means that you cannot be with anyone. Why? Because if a woman is not married, she's not allowed to go to a mikveh. Which means that all of these cute little single girls that you see, guess what? They're all nida. They're all nida. Meaning if, you give, if your best friend happens to be a girl, you say, hey, hey, Steve, hey, Stacy, how are you? Nida. You have a serious problem in Shemaim. Shemaim. Hey, Sarah. Hey, Steve. Ooh, what? Give me a kiss. You know, people do this today. They think they're in Europe. Give each other a kiss on the cheek. Hey, hey. why are you kissing? Who is this woman with you? Everybody kisses each other. They hug each other like they haven't. You saw each other in the last, uh, the last class. You're in eighth period. Now it's ninth period. We have to kiss each other again. This is Nida. In Judaism, you're not allowed to touch a bat Israel unless she... Is either your mom, you're allowed to hug her if she's your mom, or she's your wife. Even your sister, if she's older than 12 years old, it's highly not recommended to even touch her. Allowed, but only stupid people do it. That's what the Rambam says, literally. Rambam says it in the only stupid people touch their sister. No, 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 no. I'm talking about just like uh, give a hug to his own sister. He says only stupid people do such things. That have empty brains. Now, what's another what's another way to disconnect? Isul Goya. Being with a non-Jewish girl. Being with a non-Jewish man. You have a serious problem. Now, somebody asked me yesterday, people send me questions. I love the questions people ask me. Why? Because it tells me where we are in a generation, because if a religious person is asking me such a question, needless to say, the non-religious also doesn't know. So a religious student of mine, fantastic student, a student, asked me a question. He says, listen, it says in the parasha that a Kohen, a Kohen is not allowed to marry a Zona. He's not allowed to marry a Zona. He says, why would anybody want to marry a Zona? Now most people understand the word Zona as prostitute, which it does mean that. But Torah says Zona is not just a prostitute. Zona also means a Jewish girl that was intimate with a goy. One time in her life. A Jewish girl that was intimate with a goy one time in her life, for the rest of her life, she's considered a Zona according to the Torah. She is not allowed to marry a, a Kohen. She's allowed to marry anybody else. She's chuba, she's tzadika, she's perfect, she's amazing. She's just not allowed to marry a Kohen anymore. Why? Kohen is not allowed to marry a Zona. This is how significant intimacy is in Judaism. Why? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, Kedoshim to you. You be holy because I am holy. Other issues are like Chilul Shabbat. Somebody that drives on Shabbat, plays on their phone on Shabbat, works on Shabbat, smokes cigarettes on Shabbat. It's Isu Karet. Eating chametz on Pesach, 
eating on Yom, Ki- on Yom Kippur, and so on. There are 36 different sins. But the point is, Rabotai, is that if you know that you're not supposed to do it, first and foremost, before you're even considering violating it, find out if it's karet. If it's karet, it's definitely not worth it. Why? Because to do tshuva for karet is not easy. Now, the Gemara Masechet Chulin, page 24b, says, Rabbi Hanina, they ask him, where did you get all your strength? Became gdolado, but it wasn't only a giant in Torah, powerful in Torah, but he was also physically strong. At 80 years old, he was able to take his shoes off and on, on one foot. Now you, 18, 20 year olds, probably could do it easily. I can't, double your age or more actually. But for an 80 year old to do that, obviously you need a lot of strength. So they ask Rabbi Hanina, where did you get the strength? He says, the chameen and the oil that my mother gave me when I was young, gave me the strength. Meaning, he is grateful for what he has 80 years later. For what? For what his mom gave him when he was a kid. Meaning that he's not only grateful for what she gave him, but he's still connected to it 70, 75 years later. This, yes. Um, how do you repent? How can you repent for karet? How can you repent for karet? It starts off with stop doing it. it. Starts off with that. Once you stop violating Shabbat, stop violating all these other things, already you have achieved 90% of the battle. Second thing is, is say I'm sorry to Kadosh Baruch Hu. I'm sorry, I didn't know it was this bad. Sorry I did it. Third, commit to not going back to it. Say, I promise Hashem, I'm going to do my best not to go back to this Goya. I'm going to do my best never to drive on Shabbat. I'm going to do my best never to do this, make this sin again. And ultimately, get to a point where you regret it. You regret that you ever did it. Meaning that even though you enjoyed it when you did it, you have to learn enough about this topic that you get to a point where you regret the actual sin. It's no longer enjoyable to you. Now, Rabbi Hanina says that one of the critical parts of overcoming the obstacles of the Yetzirah, all of the desires that we have, all of the things that lead us to sin, is remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. Remember that your mom toiled so hard to get you here. Remember that your grandmother toiled so hard to get you here. During the Holocaust, there were millions of people being butchered simply because they were Jewish. Even if they themselves did not want to be Jewish, even if they themselves wanted to be like the Goyim, they were butchered because they were Jewish. HaKadosh Baruch Hu designed the world in such a way to make sure that whether you like it or not, you're always going to be reminded at some point in your life that you are a Jew. If you accept it with love, you're better for it. If you reject it, you'll suffer because of it. Now, when a person learns about his heritage, when a person learns about what it took to get to here, for you to be a Jew today, it's very, very simple to understand why it's worth it to continue. Because if you think about it, 3,300 years ago, Moshe Rabbeinu and millions of Bnei Israel were at Mount Sinai, accepted the Torah and the mitzvot. Guys, try to finish as soon as you can and sit down so it's not like a hangout. Please, I don't mind you eating, just don't socialize. There are still other people here. Moshe Rabbeinu and millions of other people heard the voice of God, saw the words of God, accepted all of it. And for the next 3,000 years, Jews will be killed Jews will be tortured, Jews will be persecuted generation after generation, whether it's in Turkey, or it's in Morocco, or it's in Spain, 
or it's in Nazi Germany, or it's by Romans, or by the Greeks. Every major civilization, at some point or another, world domination was not enough for them. They had to go and disturb this little Jewish nation. Now, why do these Jews continue to struggle? Why do these Jews continue to fight? Why do they continue? Why don't they just say to the Greeks, listen, you know what? What, you want me to be a Greek? Why, you want me to put them some skirt on and become homosexual like you? Okay, fine. Why don't they just accept it? Now, unfortunately, some, some of them did. Some of them became Greeks. But still, in every generation, we had just enough, reject it, hold on to the Torah, and sacrifice their life for it. Why? It's a fantastic question if you actually think about it. Why would anybody hold on to a book of laws that restricts his life, that tells him that he's not allowed to be with any girl that he wants, that tells him that he's not allowed to do whatever he wants, that tells him that if he does whatever he wants, he can get punished for it. Mm. Why should he sacrifice his life for a book that restricts him? Rav Chaim Ozil was one of the Gdolei Ado. He was the brother-in-law of the Chafetz Chaim. Mm. Now, the Chafetz Chaim lived in a house that in today's world probably wouldn't be allowed to exist because of how unkept it was. He did not allow his own wife to put a floor, to put tiles on the floor. His floor was sand. Why? He says, this is uh, too much. We're enjoying this world too much. If we put, if we put uh, stones... We're enjoying this world too much where if somebody comes to the house and they would, in mud just now, you're going to probably care so much that they're making your, your floor muddy that you're not going to want to welcome guests anymore. So it's better off not to have tiles on the floor. So one day his wife says to him, how come you, Chavetz Chaim, are not uh, allowing yourself to enjoy this world? No tiles on the floor. No, 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 uh, nothing covering the windows. Well, much nothing, like a very, like a shack. But my brother, Arab Gudinsk, also has a Tami Chacham. His house is like a castle. Arab Chaim Ozel, his house is like a castle. Chafetz Chaim says to how can you compare? Arab Chaim Ozel, he's a melech. He's a melech, he's a king, he's the Gdolador. Uh, it's an obligation of the Torah. To make sure that the melech of the generation lives in a palace. What am I? I'm just a Baal Makolet. I'm just, uh, I just own a little store, Delhi. This is Chafetz Chaim saying about himself. So Rav Chaim Ozer, who the Chafetz Chaim called the melech of the generation, who everybody in the exile had to thank for even having Judaism in that generation, thanks to him, he himself was an orphan. And he says... They asked him, what made Rav Chaim, Ozer, Rav Chaim Ozer? He says, the only reason I became Rav Chaim Ozer, the only reason I was able to put together the Sefer, the book, Shut Achiezer, is because every morning, my mother, even though it wasn't his biological mother, he was grateful enough to call him his mother. Unlike some people that I meet, where they, for some reason, resent their parents that adopted them. He says, my mom, every morning, she would bake me a little cake and give me hot milk. And she would wake me up with the smell of the cake and the hot milk. And I would be excited to go and eat the cake and drink the milk and go, she would send me to go learn Torah. And then I would be excited to come home after learning Torah all day, because again, my mom would make, bake me a little cake and make me hot milk again. Every day, same thing. He says, because of that milk, because of that cake, because she sent me to go learn Torah, that's what made me Chaim, Chaim Ozer. He didn't say because I learned a lot, because I studied at night, because I did Mesirut Nefesh, because my rabbi was great, because, uh, you know, I happened to have a really good memory, because I had a good chavut, none of that. What made me great? My ima, she made me cake, 
She made me milk, and she constantly sent me to go learn Torah. Why? Because when she made me milk, and she gave me the cake, she says, you're going to go learn Torah today. She showed me it's important to go learn Torah. So when she showed me it's important to go learn Torah, I want to go learn Torah. So when I went and learned Torah, I was thinking, wow, it's important to learn Torah. And I started liking learning Torah. And then I say, well, I can't wait to get home and tell Ima, what? Ima, I learned Torah. He says, oh, you learned Torah. Here's some milk. Here's a cake. He says, that is what made me the Gedolado. If a person spends a minute thinking about all of the sacrifice that their mother made for them, if it doesn't lead you to cry, you simply don't have a heart. Or you have a bad memory. Hopefully it's a bad memory. If a person thinks about all the sacrifice that his wife, if you're married, makes for you every single day, and it doesn't lead you to cry, either you don't have eyes, or you don't have a memory. Hopefully it's the memory again. Because we can fix that. Now, the Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 17a, brings a pasuk from the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah says something very interesting that the Chachamim are wondering. The pasuk talks about how Isaiah is talking to the women of his generation. And he says, Nashim Shananot, Kom Nashamana Kole Banot Botchot Azina Imrati. Aozna Imrati. He says, O oh, complacent women, rise up and hear my voice. O oh, confident daughters, give ear to my speech. Now, in essence, what he's really trying to tell him here is stop being so complacent because things are not as good as you think they are. But the Chachamim say, what's the other lesson we should learn from here? When is a woman allowed to be complacent? What's complacent? Complacent meaning, I'm okay. You say, everything okay? Everything's okay. Baruch Hashem. When are you allowed to just sit there complacent? Everything's okay. As a woman. Come on, ask this question. When is a woman allowed to say, be uh, considered Nashim Shananot? As a woman that's complacent, everything's okay. Baruch Hashem, how are you? Baruch Hashem. How? When? When? Are you ever allowed to be complacent? So the Gemara in Masechet Brachot says the following. The promise made to women from heaven is even bigger than the one that was made to men. Because a woman has bigger power to get to heaven than even her husband. Again, the promise made to women is even bigger than the one that was made for men because her power to get to heaven, mm-hmm. her ability to get to heaven is even more significant, a bigger heaven, a better heaven than her own husband. So Gemara asks, for what? Why is she even going to heaven? He's, the, he's going to call him. He's going to yeshiva. She's not learning to why she become a Rabbi Akiva on the cover. Why? He says the woman gets heaven because she sends her kids to go learn Torah and she waits for her husband until he comes back home from the Bet Midrash. Why does she go to heaven? She goes to heaven because she sends her kids to go learn Torah. And because she waits for her husband to come back from the Shi'ul Torah at 11 o'clock at night. For that. So then the Chachamim say, well, I'm even more confused than when I started. First you said the women are going to go to a bigger heaven. You're saying that if their husbands go learn Torah, if their kids go to Yeshiva, they could be shanano, they could be content, everything is okay. And you're saying they're going to get a bigger heaven than the husband. Why? The husband is the one that's going to yeshiva. The husband's going to learn Shul Torah at 9 o'clock at night. The kid's the one that's going to be in school all day. Why is she the one getting a bigger heaven? And the Gemara continues, says, women benefit 
to have a bigger ulama ba because they're the engine. They're the engine that gives the kids and the husband the power to go learn Torah. And as it is stated, Gadola me'ase mina'ose. Greater is the reward for the one who influences another to make a mitzvah than the one that fulfills the mitzvah himself. You get a greater reward for bringing somebody to the shiur Torah than what you're going to get for actually going to the shiur Torah yourself. You get a bigger benefit for encouraging somebody to do a mitzvah than you get for you doing a mitzvah itself. But it also works the opposite. It's a bigger sin to lead another person to sin than to sin yourself. So when a woman leads a husband and our kid to go learn Torah, she's giving them power. Why? If the wife thinks it's important, the husband's going to think it's important. If the wife thinks it's not important, then the husband's not going to think it's important. If every time the husband says, I'm going to shield Torah, and she's like, oh man, again? Again, why don't you spend time with me? You have no idea what it means to be a wife. Now, Rav Galinsky, Rav Shalom, was one of the greatest Mezakeh Rabim of his generation. And one time he was visiting America and he gave a shiul, they invited him to give a shiul to a bunch of women whose husbands were studying half the day, studying Torah half the day, and working half the day. So Av Galinsky says, there is a Gemara in the Torah, Gemara Masechet Yoma, page 77a, that goes over a pasuk in Tehilim. It says, it's vain for you who rise early, who sit up late, who eat the bread of sorrows, for indeed, he gives his beloved, his beloved ones restful sleep. Psalm 127, verse 2. David says, he talks about the women of Israel. But not Israel. He says, it's hard for you, it's vain for you. Wake up early to go take the kids to school. Wake up early, tell the husband to go learn a little bit, go pray. Wake up early, start the house. Now wake up at 11. You wake up before the kids. Why? So you prepare the kids for school. So you prepare the husband for Beknesset. So you prepare the house. Now I wake up at uh, 11 o'clock. Honey, I'm still tired. Wake up early. Yeah, but it's hard. He says, exactly. I went, up, I went to sleep late. He goes, exactly. That's what the rest of the pasuk says. The rest of the pasuk, that's what it says. He says, it's vain for you who, for, who rise early, who sit up late. Not only did you wake up early, you went to sleep late. Why did you go to sleep late? Because the kid didn't want to go to sleep. He was crying all night. The husband had a stomach ache. The other kid had a stomach ache. Everybody had a stomach ache. You have no idea what's going on, but you have to be there. Why? Because no one can go. If they're not asleep, you can't go to sleep. Your mommy. He says, it's vain for you. You go to sleep, uh, you go to sleep late. You wake up early. What do you eat? You eat the bread of sorrow. The bread, what do you eat? You ever see a mom that has little kids in the house? She can barely eat. Why? Because there's always somebody crying, somebody's annoyed, somebody's this, somebody's sick. She never has time to eat. She has to eat like a bank robber. Like in between, like uh, in between missions. Why? Because they always think like somebody's chasing him. Oh, he just grabs something. He doesn't know what it is. He's just eating. He just, just to live. That's, a, that's how mothers are. Why? Because you don't know how much time you actually have before the next baby cries, before this one. Something happens. You can't eat like everybody else. They have dinner, and you're sitting there, and so on. I see your hand. I just have to finish the point. So you see that Abad Israel has kids, has a husband. And David the Menach says, I already know your life. You wake up really early. You go to sleep really late. Even eating a healthy diet is almost impossible for you. Even eating like a normal human being is almost impossible for you. But you should know. Hashem gives His beloved restful sleep. Rav Galinsky says, the Gemara says, what does this mean? He says, 
when you're a Bat Yisrael and you wake up early and you go to sleep late and you feed, you eat the bread of sorrows because you're sending your husband to the Kolel. You're sending your husband to go learn Torah. You're sending your kids to go learn Torah. You're constantly doing everything, 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 everything to keep the machine going because you're the engine. You, my friend, become Hashem's beloved. You are considered Yedid Hashem. What's Yedid Hashem? You're friends with Hashem. That's what the Pasuk says. The Pasuk says that a woman becomes Yedido Shana. The Yedida, the friend of Hashem. So Rav Galinsky says to the, to, the, to the women in the lecture, he says, I'll tell you the truth. If I had a letter from the Chazonish, he says, if I had a letter from the Chazonish, Gdolado, previous generation of him, if I had a letter from the Chazonish, Hey, Yankale, Yedidi, Yankale, my dear friend, Yankale, which is Rav Galinsky's name, Yaakov Yankale, Yedidi, Yankale, if I just had that, I don't have anything to worry about. Hopefully, I just wait until Hashem takes my neshama back. I just go, and I just ask my will. Only thing I ask, bury me with the letter. Why? I go to Shemaim. I go to Shemaim with a letter from the Chazonish saying, I'm his friend. I'm set. I'm set. He says, imagine if I had a letter from the Rambam. If I had a letter from the Rambam, it says, Yankale Yedidi, Yedidi Yankale. My dear friend, Yankale. The Rambam wrote me a letter, says, My dear friend, Yankale. I go to Gainom. Gainom gets scared of me. Why? I have a letter that the Rambam called me his friend. Rambam calls me his friend. Malach is scared of me. He says, Imagine I have a letter from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai. I have a letter from Rabbi Akiva, his rabbi. Rabbi Akiva writes me a letter, Yankale, my dear friend. Doesn't matter what the rest of the letter. It's worth to come to this world, get the letter, die, you're finished. You're good. Why? You go up to Shemaim with this letter, they can't touch you. Why? You're friends with the Rambam. You're friends with Rabbi Akiva. You're friends with Moshe Rabbeinu. You're friends with Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu says, Yankale, my dear friend, you have nothing else to worry about. He says, B'not Israel, you have an opportunity. You have an opportunity of a lifetime. Why? You have something in writing. But not from the Chazonish, not from the Rambam, not from Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, not from Rabbi Akiva, not even from Moshe Rabbeinu. You have something from Akadosh Baruch Hu. You have a letter from Akadosh Baruch Hu saying what? You want to be my friend? You want to be my beloved? Send your kids to Talmud Torah. Send your husband to Shiur Torah. Send your husband to learn Torah. You... My beloved, you and me, we're best friends. Best friends. The, the next day, Rav Galinsky went to go collect money at a yeshiva, the big yeshiva, I went to get, collect money. They sent him to a place, businessman, had a lot of money. He went to his office, he goes, oh, you're Rav Galinsky. I'm not giving you anything. Okay. No, but I'm going to tell you why. Oh, you tell me why too. No, they're not going to tell you no. They want to tell you why they will tell you no. Okay, tell me why. He goes, you ruined my life. He goes, you ruined my life. How did I ruin your life? He says, I have a business. I'm running this business 40 years. Baruch Hashem, I have a wonderful daughter. I found my wonderful daughter a nice husband. The husband learns. But we had an agreement. Once they get married, the husband learns for a couple of years. But after he learns for a couple of years, he's going to come take over my business. I could go retire. I've already working for 40 years. I go retire. I set up everything. The office. I set him up his own office. I set up everything. Today's supposed to be his first day. Instead of him coming, taking over the company today, I get a phone call from my daughter. Abba, uh, my husband's not coming to work. Why, he's sick? No. Why, something happened? No. So why is he coming to work? He's going to be in the cola. Well, for how long? He's been already there for a couple of years. He goes, forever. Why? What happened to our agreement? He's going to run the business, a million dollar company. No, no, I, I, I don't want it. You don't want it? No, I don't want to go to work. Why not? I want to be friends with Hashem. I went to Shul Torah, I went to Rav Galinsky last night, and he told me if I want to be friends with Hashem, if I want Hashem to call me my beloved, I have to send my, my husband to go. I am not willing to give it up. 
I want to be friends with Hashem. So the guy says to Rav Galinsky, see, that's why I'm not giving any money. So Rav Galinsky says, Baruch Hashem, that I have the merit to be partners with somebody that's friends with Hashem. You see, Rabotai, when a person understands the significance of things, he understands why he's here, why, who, what, when, and how. But unfortunately, as I told you before, it also works the opposite. If a mom does not send her kids to school, that's religious. If her mom does not send her husband to a place of Torah, and instead she asks him, why don't you take me to a movie? Why don't you go with me to the mall? Why don't we go to Cancun so we could be naked on the beach with the rest of the green? When a woman does such a thing, she also inherits the bigger sin. Now the Midrash Me'am Loez by Rav Kuli is one of the more popular midrashim that uses in every midrash anywhere between 500 to 1500 sources. It's unbelievable how many sources you have in every single one of the books. And anyone who doesn't know, Rav Kuli was one of the Gdolei Ado 300 years ago. And when he was writing the midrash Me'am Loez, he would fast for a week straight. He would fast for a week straight, learn, write the book, write everything, the whole week, no eating, no drinking, nothing. Not like he's only fasting for a few hours, you know, in between meals, like us. In between meals, he's having a diet. You know, some people say, you're on a diet? Yeah, yeah, in between meals. What was the last meal? An hour ago, I had a burger. So, when, so when's the diet? Till, till the next burger. No, he stopped eating Motzei Shabbat, not eating until Shabbat again, for a whole week. And the whole time he's learning. Mamash wrote, wrote this book with Ruach HaKodesh. Now he brings different sources from across the Torah, from the Zohar, from the Gemara, from the Shulchan Aruch, from the, Achroni, from the uh, Rishonim, uh, giants. And he says the following. He says there are certain, we got in Parashat Yitro, we got the Ten Commandments. One of the commandments is idolatry. Do not become an idol worshiper. Do not make an image. Don't go buy a Buddha statue and put it in your house. Don't worship a rabbi. Don't worship some uh, athlete. Don't buy any statues. Don't donate to, you know, to uh, churches, and so on and so forth. He says, but idolatry also has taint of idolatry, meaning that when a person makes a obvious sin, he doesn't need much help from the Torah to explain to him that this is no good. So Torah, the oral Torah is there to explain to us that sometimes we can make sins where we don't even realize it's a sin, or even if we know it's a sin, we don't realize how grave it is. So in Parashat Yitro, he says the following. What's taint of idolatry? He says a person must teach his children the correct way and make sure that they obtain good Torah education and keep the norms of Judaism from their childhood. One must make sure that by the time the child becomes older, he knows how to live as a Jew and will respect God and his teachings. But if a parent spoils his children and doesn't give them a good Torah education, meaning sends them to public school or sends them to one of these uh, fake yeshivot where there's boys and girls or sends them to one of these yeshivot that 30% of the students are going bechlal, which by the way, there are many, here in Florida, they call themselves yeshiva, but 30% of the students, and I know this with my own eyes, 30% of the students are not even Jewish. If a parent spoils their kids, gives them whatever they want, he sends them to yeshiva because his friends go there. Yeah, but his friend is Mustafa. Yeah, but he goes to yeshiva, Mustafa. Yeah, Mustafa is an Arab. Yeah, but he goes to yeshiva, he learns Modeani. Yeah, he can learn Modeani all he wants, but he's still an Arab. You cannot go to school with Mustafa. You cannot go to school with Chris. You can't. Why? You're a Jew. He's not. What happens if my parents send me there? He says, if a parent sends his kids and doesn't give them a good education, and they're not going to learn how to keep the commandments, this parent is in constant violation of idol worshiping. Is a constant violation of do not make a carved image where Kadosh Baruch Hu says in the Ten Commandments, don't make a carved image. Yeah, but what does one thing have to do with the other? 
He says, raising a child that's gonna, not going to have proper Jewish education is making a carved image, making a pesel, because the child will grow up to become a rebel and will dishonor his parents, will dishonor God. In the end, he's probably going to seek out other religions. He's going to want to find out what does Christianity have to offer? What does Mustafa have to offer? What does Buddha have to offer? What is India that worships the cow and the rat and the uh, motorcycle and everything that moves and doesn't move? What do they have to offer? He wants to go to Hodu. He wants to go to India after the army. This child will seek out other religions and everything except Judaism. The child is apt to commit all sorts of sexual offenses from the Torah and even commit murder. If the child is not educated in his religious roots, he can commit all sorts of crimes because a child without firm religious value system is susceptible to all baneful influences. Source, Zohar, page 93, Parashat Yitro. Further, it says, a person also has to be careful when he's expressing Torah ideas, if he's giving a chidush. Why? If the chidush that he says, some insight that he says from the Torah, is not falling within the rules of the Torah, it just comes and makes sense to him. That's also a form of idolatry. So you have to be very careful if you're bringing a new insight from the Torah that's just out of your own common sense. Because a fake chidush is equal to a taint of Abu Dazara. And the punishment for a person like that is that his soul will never ascend to, will never get to a good place in Olam Abba because he changed the Torah. Same thing goes with fake rabbis. He says that when the uh, rabbis are, uh, make far-fetched interpretation of the Torah just to fit their contemporary themes, you know, these politically correct sermons, in order to please their congregants, they're not aware of the tremendous damage that their, their words are causing. And as a result of their false interpretations, mm -hmm. their souls are also cut off and are not allowed to ascend to the heavenly chambers. And this also falls under Abu Dazara. Now, there are many other aspects of Abu Dazara, but the point is, Rabu is that a person knows that sometimes the sin is clear. Not allowed to do this. Not allowed to light fire on Shabbat. Not allowed to eat pig. Not allowed to desecrate Hashem's name. Certain things are obvious. But Torah is here to tell us that sometimes it's not so obvious. Sometimes you don't think it's a big deal to go to public school. Sometimes you don't think it's a big deal to go see a movie. A PG-13 movie. A rated R movie. A Gehenno movie. You, know, so you don't think it's a big deal. Torah says it's a big deal. Why? It starts with one thing. And leads to many other things if a person is connected to his roots connected to his mother he could overcome this but if his mother herself is sending him to this stuff then guess what not only will you be punished she'll get punished even worse than him now all of us have heard the story of Noah all of us have heard the story of Am, story of Am Yisrael that left Egypt, was taken out of Egypt, and eventually arrived at the land of Israel. But what many people forget is that before Am Yisrael arrived at Israel, the land was owned. Who was it owned by? Canaan, the Canaanites. So the question is, how come Hashem took the land from them? How come Hashem took the land from them? Now you can see there's a pasuk in the Torah. It says, yo, they made a lot of sins. But what's the foundation? What's the worst part? The Midrash Me'am Loi says, Knan, Knan had a very serious problem with Hashem. What was his problem? He didn't respect his father. He is the one that raped Noah after the flood. He disrespected his father, didn't listen to his father, and that's why Noah cursed him. 
And Noach told him, huh? Ham. No, Canaan was his son. But Canaan was the one that actually did the uh, rape. Shem Ham Vyefik. Yes, Ham. Yeah, but Canaan started it. Start, Canaan started it, the son. Ken, but Canaan, Canaan is is the uh, is is the one that caused a lot of the trouble. Now, he didn't respect his father. He didn't honor his father. Even when his father told him no. And Hashem cursed him. Hashem cursed Canaan. Hashem cursed Canaan. In the Torah, as a pasuk in the Torah, Hashem cursed Canaan that he is going to be cursed Ham, which goes the curse goes to Canaan. Canaan is going to be a slave to the other descendants. Now, he had a brother. His brother was named Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim is Egypt. So the curse became fulfilled when Egypt was at one point the master of of Bnei Israel. Egypt was the master, Bnei Israel was the slaves. When was the curse fulfilled? When Am Yisrael arrived at Eretz Yisrael. Why? Because now Canaan became the slave of the slave. Because Am Yisrael was technically slaves of, of his brother, Egypt. Mitzrayim. And now Canaan became the slaves of Israel. That's when the curse was fulfilled. Why? Why did it start? It started because of dishonoring the parents. Disconnecting from where we came from. Now... Honoring your parents starts off with first and foremost understanding where and who and what you're made of yourself. So the Torah explains in the Kabbalah that each part of you physically and spiritually has an, someone that's contributing. So there's three partners to a per, each person. The father, the mother, and a Kadosh Baruch Hu. Now what does each one contribute? The father contributes five things. The bone, the nerve tissue, the brain, the fingernails, and the white part of the eye. That's what the father contributes. The mom contributes also five things. The skin, the flesh, blood, hair, and the dark part of the eye. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu contributes ten things. Can they get both of them? Five and five, and he does ten. He contributes the neshama, the spirit, the soul, the uh, radiance of the face, the look of a person's face when he's alive is a world apart different than if the person died. The eyesight, the hearing, speech, the ability to walk, knowledge, understanding and, and intellect, which is chokhmah uh, bina vadat, the knowledge, understanding and intellect. And once a person dies, what does it mean? It simply means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu took, part, it took back his part. He left the mom and the dad, their parts. The eyes, the, uh, the, uh, the bones, everything else left. But without HaKadosh Baruch Hu's part, the partnership fails. That's when a person dies. Now, one of the most extraordinary examples of understanding what it means to connect to your past, understanding the results of hard work of a parent, hard work of a mom, is in our history many times. There's countless stories, but one of the most famous stories you'll see in the uh, several places in the Book of Maccabees, in the Gemara Masechet Gitin, page 57a or 57b. Uh, you also see it in. Uh, in a Midrash Me'am Loez and several other places, which is the story of Chana and her seven sons. Now, in your tefillah every day, in tefillah Shachrit, you say a pasuk from Tehilim, which is Zorea Atzdakot, Matzmiach Yeshuot, Borei Refuot, that Akadosh Baruch Hu sows righteousness makes the salvation flourish and creates cures. So the Chachamim say, what does this mean? He says, sometimes a person gives staka, a person does something good, and Hashem, instead of giving him the reward right away, he plants it. 
He plants it for another day. He plants it. I'm not going to give him a reward right now. I'll give him a reward when he needs it. That's why it says, Matzimiyach The salvation comes when? When he needs it. Not right now. Right now, yeah, he's giving staka because he wants to get this deal, but I'm not going to make the deal happen. I'm going to take this staka, I'm going to give him something at a later time. Why? Because 10 years later, he's going to need the money. Right now, he doesn't need the money. Right now, he just wants the money. So the story of Hana is one of the great examples that we have in our nation as somebody that planted many, many seeds and saw the seeds flourish in a very extraordinary way, to say the least, that if somebody learns the story, it gives you an understanding of who you could be related to if you choose to be a righteous Jew. Now, the story of Hana goes as follows. A couple of thousand years ago, the Antiochus of the Greek Empire, or Roman Empire, decided that he wants to outlaw Judaism. But that wasn't enough. He wants to make sure that it's not only not legal to be a Jew, but they all bow to his idol. Hana is caught by one of his uh, generals named Polypus, Imachimo, and he brings Hana and her seven sons. There's no mention of the husband. Maybe he died, maybe he wasn't around, whatever the case is. But he brings Hana and her seven sons in front of the Caesar, in front of the Antiochus. And Antiochus commands them, one after another, to bow to him. Now I'm going to read you details of the story word for word because you probably heard the story before where the story starts with just like I said each one says no I don't want to bow he kills each one of them and they all die in Kiddush Hashem now this is a superficial understatement where when somebody says something like this where Hana and our sons did not want to bow to an idol and they died and they died in Kiddush Hashem and then you hear that some reformed people that were anti-God were murdered by some psychopath in Pittsburgh and people say that was also Kiddush Hashem it's not so far-fetched why they died because they didn't want to buy to an idol they died in Pittsburgh because some guy killed them because they were Jewish even though they themselves did not recognize Judaism for what it is so Kiddush Hashem Kiddush Hashem it's not so far-fetched for both of it to be considered Kiddush Hashem today people throw Kiddush Hashem on every single accident Somebody slipped on a banana in the middle of the highway, but said Shema Yisrael at some point at uh, five hours before Kiddush Hashem. Somebody uh, got murdered by some terrorist Kiddush Hashem. Somebody uh, didn't go to uh, church because he was late. Kiddush, everything is Kiddush Hashem today. So I'm a, I want to give you a real example of what Kiddush Hashem is. What is the Torah called Kiddush Hashem? Why is it called Kiddush Hashem? So, the source is several places. You can pass these three pictures around. You'll understand what I mean in a minute. Source is several different places. The book of Maccabees, chapter Bet, Me'am Loez, Parashat Yitro, Gemara Masechet Gitin, page 57b. And I even double-checked with the... Uh, or not double checked, Chas Shalom, but uh, I found that even the Christians published a book 200 years ago in 1827 called The Epitome of General Ecclesiastical History. In essence, talking about the history from the beginning of the world all the way to Christianity and thereafter. And they obviously mentioned the Jews. And one of the things that they mentioned is, or actually they have a picture of, is the story of Hana. What picture do they have? They have a picture of what happened to Hana's children. By who? By Christians. By their own people. What do they do to them? So now, Tzedeket aita Hana, vela shiva banim. Yom echad tafas polipus, pakid ha-melech et Hana v'shiva baneha, v'eviam lifnei ha-melech antiochus. 
the righteous Chana had seven sons, and one day Polypus, one of the uh, generals of the of the king, caught them and brought Chana and her seven sons to Antiochus the king. The king took the first son as the other the rest of the family is watching. The rest of the family is watching. All the son is there. And the king tells him, What do you need this Torah? Bow to the king, bow to the idol. Or else. I'm going to kill you in a very strange and unusual death. The son responds. He says, I don't even waste your words. I'm not going to teach you the Torah. He says, don't even waste your words and try to teach us your mistakes. Your false beliefs. Our Torah is Torah Emet that was given to us from our fathers and our forefathers and our forefathers, and we're not going to remove ourselves from it, not right or left. So, Adonia Melech, hey, Mr. King, don't uh, waste your words, don't, make, don't say too much. If your will is to kill me, go ahead, do it right away. Hurry up, actually, so I can go and be in a hurry to go see a Kadosh Baruch Hu now. The king couldn't believe that this young man is talking to him this way. He got his soldiers to go bring a huge pan. And they put oil in it, boil the oil, and put the person in there, put the son in there, and started literally frying him after they cut off his tongue his feet and his and his uh, arms his uh, hands and you see in the pictures that's from the christian book that's exactly what you see in the pictures in multiple places aside from that they removed his skin his tongue and Mamash tortured him in a horrible way until he died on kiddush Hashem. Why? Tell him bow to an idol. He says, bow to an idol. Do whatever you're about to do. Go ahead, do it in a hurry. Why? I want to go see Hashem. Not even a consideration. Now maybe he was a Tamil Chacham, Tzadik, Kadosh, 20 years he's learning already. So he'd say, you know what? Surely the younger ones are not as strong as him. They brought him the second son. No. Better to die in that sin. There's three sins that you're not allowed to do and you have to die for. One is Avodah Zarah, which is idol worship. Another one is murder. You're not allowed to commit murder. And the third one is a sex crime. Somebody tells you, you know, either have sex with this woman or, uh, or uh, will kill you, you have to die. But it's not better to do one of and then do a lot of mitzvot? HaKadosh Baruch Hu says no. If it was me, I'd tell you yes, but I'm not a Kadosh Baruch Hu. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says there's three sins you have to die for. You have to die. If they tell you go to a church or we kill you, you have to die. If they tell you, go worship uh, Buddha or we kill you, you have to die. If they tell you, go a, uh, rape this woman or we kill you, you have to die. You have to tell you, go kill somebody else or we kill you, you have to die. But that's the three that's obvious. What most people don't know is that that's when it's private. When it's private, when it's one-on-one. -on -one. They tell you, go worship an idol or we kill you, you have to do it. But if it's public... If it's public, meaning there's a lot of people, there's a lot of people that are watching, and they say, 
there's an alacha, there's an alacha that you have, look, I'm just making up an alacha right now, that uh, Jews uh, only wear, you know, let's say, uh, blue shoelaces. Violate the alacha. Violate the alacha that from now on, you're not going to wear blue shoelaces. You have to die. And keep that alacha. Why? Because now it's public. That's public. Because if you violate it, it's called Chilul Hashem. Chilul Hashem is the worst sin in the Torah. So now the second son arrived, and the Melech tells him, the king tells him, this evil king tells him, bow to the idol, or I'm going to kill you just like I killed your brother, with, with a lot of uh, viciousness and so on. The, son, the second son re- responds to him, hurry up the fire, hurry up the sword, do with me whatever you want, but please... Don't detract from me anything you've done to my brother. Meaning, make sure whatever you did to my brother, do also to me. Don't not do something to me. Do everything you did to him. Do it to me also. Why? I'm also like him. I'm not less righteous than him. I don't have less yacha mind than him. I want to die in Kiddush Hashem just like him. Second son. The king was in shock. The king was in shock, did not understand how this kid just told him, not only kill me, but make sure that all the torture that you did to my brother, do it to me also. And then the son, here's the guy threatening him again. So the son responds to him. Oy ve'oy alecha achzar al nafshotenu. Atachshov ki tikar et nafshotenu la'asot behem kechavtzecha. He says, Woe unto you, you vicious, and your, your viciousness on, our, on, our, on us. What are you thinking? That you're going to do your will and whatever you want with our, uh, with our souls? Our souls are going to Akadosh Baruch Hu the one that gave them to us, to a place of extraordinary light that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created. And we will live Chaim HaRukim. We will live eternal lives, meaning heaven. A place where there is no end. But you, your soul, will go to Geinom. Will go to a place where the suffering doesn't end. The king heard this and killed the second. The third son is brought up in front of him. The third son doesn't wait for the king to talk. Right off the bat, he says to the Melech, Oi, ish tsar ve'oyev. Oi, you, you, uh, you, you wicked enemy of Hashem. What are you trying to scare me? With all these uh, punishments, with all these difficulties that uh, that you're doing, you think that that's going to scare me? We have nothing to, to be scared of. We have nothing to be concerned of. Because we know that this is the will of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. This is to repent for the sins of Am Yisrael. What you're doing to us, HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants this. Why? To repent for the sins of Am Yisrael. This is a little kid. All of the uh, suffering that we will get, we accept it with Ava. We accept it with love. Cutting off arms, cutting off legs, cutting off heads, cutting off every worst possible thing you can imagine. As you can see in the picture, so it's happening to every one of them. We accept it with love. And they're seeing their brothers going through it. It's not like each one is like living some imaginary life. They're watching their brothers going through this and say, we accept all of it with Ava. We love it. Why? This is what Hashem wants. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu iten lanu sachar peulatenu. Ve'elu ata telech la'avadon. He says, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu will give us a reward, will pay us for this, for what we're doing. But you, you're going to a never-ending suffering. Eternal damnation. The 
king is astonished by Flabeinim, and they killed the third son in front of his mom and his brothers. Comes the fourth brother. Uva ben the fourth brother, no different. He doesn't even wait for the king to say a thing. He says, don't even say anything. Don't even say anything. You achzal, you vicious person. Don't extend it. Don't tell me any things. Do whatever you want with my body. My neshama is going to my king in heaven. My salvation, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, will bring us back and will resurrect us and will come back to life at some point. King can't even handle the fourth one. He's talking with so much confidence, he doesn't even let him have a second sentence. He kills him. Same thing again, all day. Comes the fifth son. He starts cursing him. He says, Evil vaksir, you fool, you moron. He calls the king, the son, a little kid, little 10 year old kid. He says, Hey, what are you doing? You moron, you fool. You don't even understand your own actions. You don't even know what you're doing. He tells a seven year old king, You don't even know what you're doing. What do you think? He goes, what do you think? HaKadosh Baruch send us in your hands because he hates us, Chas Shalom. You think, well, Hashem hates us? Know this. He's only doing this because he loves us. And he's bringing us because to this because he wants to give us kavod. He's giving us honor by giving us this. A 10-year-old kid. He's giving us the kavod. Why? Because now we can die on Kiddush Hashem. He can't handle it. Kills the fifth son. Ba Aben Ashishi. Sixth son. Doesn't talk to him either. Sixth son talks to him in a confident way. He says, you know, Hashem is really happy with us. Hashem is really happy with us right now. He's very content with what we're doing. With all the, while dying, he's very content with that. Because this... Is kapara le'am Yisrael. This is an atonement for all of Am Yisrael, what's happening to us. And here we're going to all die. But you, he's going to uproot you from the world of the living. He kills the sick son. Now at this point, you would think, even if the seventh son is a hero like his other brothers, the mom should be hysterical. Anytime you see a mother with her kids, don't mess with them. Why? She'll kill you. She'll kill you. That's it. Don't mess with the, with, with the mother's kids. Don't mess with them. Why? She'll kill you. A mother, mamash, a mother can lift a truck over her head just to save her own kid. It's unbelievable how much mothers love their kids. Now, you would think that the mother is hysterical crying. But it continues. And it says... The mom is watching everything and she's seeing each one of our sons get killed, but this does not even affect our heart in a negative way. She's not upset. She's actually singing Alleluia. She's singing to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. She's singing that our children are dying in Kiddush Hashem. She's standing up, watching our holy children being killed, watching her, their body parts, watching their body parts on the floor, the arms, the legs, they're all cut into little pieces. She's watching all of this and she's happy. And she says this, Banai, Banai, my children, my children, I don't know how you got into my stomach. Meaning, who am I? Why? I'm gonna, th- th- there's a seed go went into my into my into my body, and you came out. Like I don't know how that works. That's a kadosh baruch hu. The fact that some seed comes from somebody else and it goes into a woman, and now that is going to be a baby from that. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. She says, I don't know how you came into my body. I don't know how 
HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the adorned you, meaning he shaped you, not only you came into my body, but he shaped you, each one with a certain face, each one with certain features. And then on top of it, he put the neshama inside you. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the God of Israel, he's the one that created you. He's the one that uh, put, uh, put you together, gave you your bones, gave you your, uh, your organs. He's the one that gave you the flesh. He's the one that covered the flesh with, a, uh, with skin and with hair. He's the one that uh, put the neshama of, of life into you. He's the one that brought you to the light of the world. And now, you gave back your neshama on, to honor is holy Torah. To die a short life, to live a short life and to die in a short life in order to, for, for Kiddush Hashem. Surely, He is going to resurrect you and bring your neshamot back. Surely, He will save you from the eternal death of Genom and will give you eternal heaven. And all of this, my children, HaKadosh Baruch Hu will pay you great reward. And you're praiseworthy that you're doing it. And I'm praiseworthy for having such children. So now this king is starting to lose hope. Why? He's looking terrible. He just killed six kids. There's one kid left. No one's bowing to him. So he tries a different strategy. He goes, he brings the son in front of him. He says, maybe this kid, he's only seven years old. He says, yeah. He says, this kid is only seven years old. Maybe I could like tempt him and, and try to seduce him with something. Try to bribe him with something. So at least this woman, this Chana over here, at least she can say, oh, I beat Antiochus. I beat Antiochus that we all, me and my children, all died on, uh, for the honor of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Maybe I can at least get this one kid and like bribe him with something. So they bring the little kid in front of him. And this kid is seven years old. And the king starts begging him. The little seven-year-old, he starts begging him. He says, please, please do what I want. Please, I swear to you, I swear to you, if you do what I want, I'm going to make you second in command. You will take over the entire kingdom after me. I'll make you my own son. You're going to take over the entire, entire kingdom. You're going to be rich with gold and, 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 and silver. The seven-year-old kid, the seven-year-old Jew answers, Antiochus, Oi Melech Zakenu Ksil, woe unto you, the king that's old and stupid. <laughs> what are you trying to honor? You're trying to impress me with your lies? You're trying to impress me with your stupidity? Quickly, do what you did. Do what you did to my brothers to me. Quickly, don't delay. So I could succeed in going to see them next to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Now, Antiochus has one stitch effort. He says, okay, this kid, brainwashed. Brainwashed, he thinks. Let me I go to his mom. So he goes to the mom. He says to the, to the mom, Isha Tova, you know, nice, uh, good woman. Have some mercy on this little boy. Have some mercy on the fruit of your, of your womb. S convince him to do what you, what you want, to do, to do what I want, so at least you'll have one son left. So Hana was very smart, obviously. And she says to him, you know, I'll talk to him. I'll talk to him. I'll convince him. I'll convince him. But I need to do it separately. I can't do it in front of you. I do it separately. So, she's separated from them and they get closer 
and away from everybody else. And one of the most amazing things in the world, conversations in the world takes place. So Hana goes to a seven-year-old son. Just imagine if you have a seven-year-old kid in your house. You have a conversation with them. It's a pretty interesting conversation when they're seven-year-olds. This is the conversation she has with a seven-year-old. No, no, it's a different Hana. She says, Bni, my son. Yes. Says, my son, pay attention to the things that I'm saying to you and understand. I carried you in my womb for nine months. I breastfed you for two years. And I fed you until this day that you are here today. And on top of that, I taught you Yirat Shamayim, fear of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and from His Torah. And you learned exactly what you can based on your age. I taught you all of it. Now, my son, Open your eyes and see the heaven and the earth. See the ocean. See the land. See the sea and the fire and the wind and all of creation. And pay attention, understand, to know that all of this was the creation of Akadosh Baruch Hu that he made with his own hands. Because after this, Akadosh Baruch Hu created man to be simple and complete in a serving of Hashem and to engrave in his heart to have fear of Hashem. And for that is what he pays reward for. But one that has assurance or confidence in another person, it won't be successful, it won't be to any to, for any use, because all of it is against God. Now, my son, don't let this vicious person seduce you with his lies. Because what will it give you? Even if you're saved from his sentence, from his death sentence now, in this moment, who will save you from the sentence from HaKadosh Baruch Hu? So please listen to me and die on Kiddush Hashem and go with your brothers. And then, my son, I will see you in your greatness, in the place of holiness, that hopefully I will be able to see you in Gan Eden. Hopefully we're all under the light of Hashem. And there we will celebrate Nagila Venismechabo. And I will come to you and I will celebrate with you as if I have seen each one of you on your wedding day. She then finalizes this with this. After the son responds, he says. He, she continued talking. So he cut her off, the kid. He says, My dear mother, why are you delaying me to go and deal with this? Why don't you let me go and join my holy brothers? Because there's no chance in the world that I'm going to listen to this stupid king. All of what he says are words zero to me. And words zero because they're against the Shem. So his mother, Hana, says to her son, says, my son, when you get up to Shemaim, go to Avraham Avinu, and you tell Avraham Avinu in my name. You tell Avraham, you are willing to sacrifice one of your sons. I sacrifice seven. Allah yeled al melech belev amitz. The child went back to the king with a strong heart says to the Melech, Oi Melech Zakenu Ksil, woe to you, stupid old king, vicious and enemy of Hashem. On who you're trying to fool, on who you're trying to win with your words, 
I'm seven years old and you're 70 and I'm making fun of everything you're doing and I know it's all I mock all of your perversions because they had all homosexuality bestiality and all types of disgusting things he goes I make fun of all the things that you do you disgusting human being I believe in the Torah of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And if we suffer here from the pain of your sentence in this world, we're all going to live eternally in a place of eternal life where there's no death. But you, you, you metoav, you, you abomination, you, you homosexual, you are away from Hashem. You are away from Hashem, our God. And you, he's going to take revenge against you. He's going to put you b'sha'ol tachtit tered. You're going to go to a certain section of Geinom called Sheol, And then tachtit. And then you're going to go in a place where there's no light and there's no chayim, and there's no life. He's given them reshit chokhmah, masechet Geinom. And you're going to go to Makom Choshech Bet Salmavit. He tells him another place in Geinom. You're going to go to the place in Geinom called Salmavit also. And you're not going to, your soul is not going to find a moment of peace, a moment of rest. Because the, uh, the uh, trouble and suffering will only surround you. And you will be constantly in fire and brimstone. Because that is your share from God. All of us have a share from God. That's your share. The king was shocked and commanded them to torture the seven-year-old more than all of the other brothers until he died on Kiddush Hashem. Once the seventh son died, Hana stood up proudly, still pure, still holy, and started singing Tehilim to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Started singing Tehilim to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Hashem, my heart rejoices in you, Hashem. Please, Hashem, take my soul back to you. So these enemies don't defile me. Because she knew that they wanted to rape her. Keep me holy. Show me the place that you've prepared for your servants. Where my sons that died on Kiddushat Shimcha, on Kiddush Hashem, show me where they are. Show me where they are and take me there. As she finished to pray, Hashem took her neshama and her body fell. At that moment, no, Hashem took our neshama. She's buried in the spot, right? At that moment, everyone that was there, which apparently that's probably the reason why even the Christian books have this story, because it's not exactly a praise to them, everyone heard a bat call come from Shemaim. A heavenly voice came from Shemaim as Hashem took our neshama out. Hashem heard, uh, everybody heard a bat call. Where Hashem quoted Tehilim, he says, Mother of sons, rejoice. Happy is the mother whose sons refuse to bow down to the idol. In the next world, they will be happy and they will be joyful. You see, Rabotai Karim, a person can send their kids to any school. A person can give their kids any education. A person can send their kids to a yeshiva, but the kids still be damaged later on. Because when he came home, the house is secular. Or a person can be sent to the best yeshiva. But perhaps even at home, it looks okay, but there's too much freedom that's being given to the son. Or perhaps the parents don't pray for the kid. Or perhaps the parents don't show the kid enough love. The point is, Rabotai, is that there's so much to parenting, there's so much to taking care of children, that if a person 
looks at it just like we say in our tefillah every single act that we do every single mitzvah that we do every single prayer that we do every single lesson that we learn it's planting a seed don't look for a reward right now HaKadosh Baruch Hu says Zorat Tzedakot plant the seeds plant your tzedakah plant all the good deeds why I am the Matzmiach Yeshuot I'm the one that makes the salvation flourish when does the salvation come exactly when you need it not necessarily when you want it to finish I'm going to tell you a couple of stories that I know the people themselves of the story Arav Alimi that I told you a story about him some months ago he's the one that runs a uh, organization with troubled teenagers and he says his great-grandfather was the Rav of Algeria one of the Gedolei Ado, his name was Rav Sidi Faret Alimi and he wrote a book called Vayomer Avram in the preface the beginning of the book Rav Alimi writes the following that when he everything that he's achieved in his life is all thanks to his mother why he said when I was a child I was a terrible kid he writes this about himself in his book thrown out of every school thrown out of yeshiva I was like the criminal of the streets but one day I woke up with a insane will to learn Torah one day I just woke up and I just said I need to go learn Torah I ran to the Bet Midrash and I've been in that Bet Midrash ever since I never left after I got older I got the thought maybe to ask my mom like maybe she knew something because I started realizing okay I, I like it I like it but why I mean I used to be a criminal I used to be terrible so I asked my mom Ima how did it happen that one day I just decided you remember she goes oh I remember she says what happened she says I saw that with every year that you were growing the trouble that was surrounding you was growing too and I knew that it's only going to get worse so I decided to pray and I took on myself a fast and I said to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, I'm gonna fast until he does tshuva I'm gonna fast until he does tshuva if it's a week I'm gonna die but at least I tried my best one day I fasted no tshuva continued fasting into the second day not eight at the end of the day continued fasting two days in a row no eating no drinking still no tshuva continued the third day three days no eating and drinking when I went to sleep that night a very old Tzaddik appeared in my dream and he said to me stop fasting from now on I'll have the desire to go learn Torah and in the dream this Tzaddik came to you and kissed you on the head the next morning you got up you went to the kollel and you haven't left since then the mom understood her son is in danger and she said Akadosh Baruch Hu, you gave me this as collateral you gave me the son as collateral I'm keeping it so if I cannot keep it I might as well die so either you fix the situation or I'm gonna die because it's better off to die than for my son to be a criminal for my son to be a Mechalel Shabbat for my son to be against the Shem it's better off for me to die why because it was my responsibility Rabbanit Cook, people that know Rav Cook in Tveria, one of the tzaddikim of the generation, got a phone call from the principal of the yeshiva that two of our sons attend. And the principal told the story to Rav Alimi, our friend, our, the Avrech in Yerushalayim. 
he calls her and he says, listen, I'm sorry, Rabbanit, but your two sons are really causing a lot of problems in school. They're causing a lot of problems. Can you please talk to them, rebuke them? She goes, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay. I'll read Tehilim for them. I said, what? What Tehilim? The, the principal says this. He goes, Tehilim? I'm thinking, what is this crazy woman? What are you talking about Tehilim? Give the kid a nice slap in the face. Tell him to stop causing trouble. But she goes, no, 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 I don't want to. Don't worry. I'll be tailing for him. I said, no, but he, they're causing a lot of trouble. It's like a, it's like a pogrom in the school with these two kids. Oh, okay, okay. Don't worry. Me and my husband, me and my husband, we're both going to be tailing for them then. We're both going to be tailing for them. The principal of the, of the school said the story. He said, I don't know what she did. I don't know what she read. I don't know what Rav Kook read, but those two kids became the best kids in school. Those two kids became the best kids in yeshiva. Two of the students of Rav Alimi himself, when they were 13, 14 years old, they were considered, even though it's a relatively religious area, they were considered the avaryanim. They were considered the criminals of the the neighborhood. They had a little quarter keeper, but just for show. We literally called the criminals of of the community. Everything and anything bad, you knew it started and ended with them. Everybody was scared to death of them. One day, they come, they ask Rav Alimi, please, can you set me up with a chavuta? Both of them. Can you set us up with a chavuta? So he sets up with a chavuta, they start learning. He says, right now, they're the best kids in the yeshiva. They're the best kids in the school. They're the best, I think, in the kolal already at this point, or maybe almost. All the yeshiva, actually. So after a few years of this, he has the two kids. What happened? Like, I never asked you. I didn't want to bother. I was so surprised that you wanted to actually learn. I, didn't, I just said, be quiet. quiet silence, is, is a, silence is a gift. Gemara said, Miguel says, if, talk, if one word is worth one dollar, quiet is worth two. I didn't say a word. But a few, a few years have passed. Baruch Hashem, you guys tell me the Chachamim already. Why? He says, both of us, we come from a house. Our parents are very simple people. Very old-fashioned people, very simple people. And you know, we didn't really care about anything, but then we started seeing that our mom, every Shabbat, would start reading Tehilim, would start praying, and we hear our names. For us, for Hashem to help us to do tshuva, and she's hysterical crying every Shabbat. Now you're not allowed to cry on Shabbat, but she couldn't control herself, she's crying for us every Shabbat, hysterical. Please, don't you run. Please, please. It's terrible. It's terrible. Eventually, it broke us. Eventually, we just couldn't do it. Could, just, we couldn't look ourselves in the mirror. Couldn't look. In the beginning, we were making fun of it. Oh, this crazy lady, crazy lady, crazy lady. Eventually, we couldn't do it anymore. Rabotai, sometimes when you're young, you make stupid things. You make stupid mistakes. You make mistakes because you don't think that's even a mistake. Some 30 years ago, a couple comes to the United States from Israel, does not know right or left, does not really have much going for them, struggling to survive, trying to start a new life, traditional Israeli. One day, after the summer is over, they decide to time to send their kids to school. They don't have money to go pay these yeshivot. They don't really think there's that much of a big deal to send their kids to American schools. And they send the kids to public schools. As the years pass and the parents get older, they see that the simple act of sending their kids to school with Goim was the biggest mistake they made in their life. Why? Because out of the four boys that they have in the house, one is still too little, but the three older ones are all going out with Goyot, one after another. They can't find a Jewish girl for their life. They're going out with new goyot every week, every month, every year, planning to marry the goyot. And during this time, 
the parents start doing tshuva. The parents start realizing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. Maybe we should stop working on Shabbat. Maybe we should start keeping Shabbat. Okay, but what are we going to do with our kids? They're still with Goyot. And one day, they realize that it's too late. The kids already feel and act like Goyim. They consider themselves Jewish. They go to the Knesset a few times a year. They have Kiddush. But as far as marrying Goyot, being with Goyot, doing things that Goyim do, they don't think about it twice. Why? We went to school with them. We hung out with them. We were friends with them. What's the problem? The mom starts praying. And she doesn't stop praying. Every day, she lights a candle. Every day, she reads Tehillim. Every day, she cries hysterical to HaKadosh Baruch Hu to save her kids from the mistake she made innocently. Why? She was 30 years old. She didn't know right or left. And the reality is she didn't think it was that much of a big deal to send kids to public school. Now we know the outcome. But it's too late now. Now the kids are already grown up. This one has that business, this one has that business, this one has this, this one has that. What am I going to do? No, but I, she prayed for our kids for 20 years. 20 years every single day, calling rabbis from all over the world, asking for blessings, asking for uh, all types of zgulot, doing all types of mitzvot, taking on more mitzvot herself, organizing Shua Torah, everything and anything she can possibly do save my kids why one of them is about to marry someone she's not jewish the other one is a new girlfriend every day none of them are jewish the other one who doesn't even know himself is jewish each one is worse than the other 20 years she prays for them Baruch hashem the first one starts doing tshuva one down second one Lives his life, starts doing tshuva a little bit, gets stronger. Third one is the problem. Why? Third one has all that life has to offer materially and is not willing to listen to anything that anyone says. Why? He's the boss. When you're the boss, one of the great benefits of being the boss is no one's allowed to tell you what to do. So you try to tell him what to do, and he says, okay. Door's over there. Don't let it hit you on the way out. I appreciate your opinion. I have one too. I have two opinions, actually, for each one you have. He's not willing to listen right. He's not willing to listen left. And it gets to a point where the prayers have to get stronger, but the prayers are not enough. So Hashem has to get involved because the prayers are not sufficient. As I told you, Rabotai, when the prayers are not sufficient and the ears are not listening, then HaKadosh Baruch Hu gets involved. But when HaKadosh Baruch Hu gets involved, it's much, much more painful. And he goes into a battle for his life for years. And throughout that battle, eventually he realizes that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. And little by little, he does tshuva. And today he's in front of you. The amount of prayers that my mom prayed for me, I don't know how many they are. All I know is for 10 years. 10 years, she prayed for me day and night just so we can fix an innocent mistake from 30 years ago. What was the mistake? Send the kid to school, just the wrong one. That's it. She didn't send me to go eat pig. We never ate pig. Not in the house, not outside the house. She didn't send me to a casino. She didn't send me to go sell drugs. She didn't send me to become a murderer. No. Everything else was normal. What was the mistake? Wrong school. But by the time she realized it, it was too late. So... 
she now has to ask for Kadosh Baruch Hu to please help me do tshuva. How? Fix it. I don't know how. Ten years of praying, ten years of suffering. I know how painful the pain is for me, but I'm sure it's much more painful to watch sometimes. The other woman in my life that saved my life is my wife. One day decided that even though I don't follow anything really, and she at the time was in a different religion, it's a good idea to make me a religious Jew. So she decides to buy me on her own. She decides to buy me a Tanakh. And she goes, here you go. I said, what am I going to do with this? She goes, read it. It's about your heritage. It's about your history. It's where you came from. That's what's going to give you the answers. I said, to what? I said, to all your questions. All the questions you have, it's in there. Read it. I said, no, I have work to do. She goes, don't work. It's holiday now. I said, what? Pesach. I said, okay, so I eat matzah. He goes, eat matzah and everything. Stay home. I'll go work. I'll run the office. I said, what do you care? She goes, I care. I need to get the answers. Why would she care? I don't know. But she cared. And every single day she cared more and more to make sure that I get religious. Every day she cared more and more that I get connected to the source. Every day she prayed. Every day she took me to the hospital whenever was needed. Every time she looked for more doctors and more medicine and more prayers and more this and more that. And you see, Rabotai, when you actually start thinking about the women in your life, whether it's your wife or it's your mom, really, if you really think about what they've done for you, you arrive at a few conclusions. First, you can never repay them because the things they did for you, you can never return. You could buy them any present in the world. won't help. You could pray back for them. still won't help. Why? You're praying to, for them under different conditions. But most importantly, most importantly, you have to realize that if you're fortunate enough to have a wife, if you're fortunate enough to have a mother, then you have to realize that no one in the world will pray for you and care for you like them. They're the only ones that are going to care for you even if sometimes they're mad at you, even if sometimes they don't feel like talking to you, even if sometimes you disagree with them. At the foundation of it all, the Torah still obligates you to honor them, to fear them, to love them, to connect to them. You have to. You have to do it. Why? Because you owe it to them. Because if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't survive a week. Now, if a person has a wife that's an enemy of God, then that's a different story. If he has a mom that's an enemy of God, it's a different story. But it doesn't mean you disconnect from them automatically. It means you have to treat the relationship differently. As long as they're not instructing you to be an enemy of God, you can have the relationship with them. But if they're telling you you have to be an enemy of God, then obviously that's a problem. The point is that you cannot just simply cut off people because they disagree with you. You cannot cut off your past because your past is not something you're interested in. You cannot simply ignore the magnitude of things that they've given to you. The fact that your wife is tolerating you at all is already a miracle if you're a guy. The fact that your mom carried you for nine months is already something you can never repay. The fact that they're literally there for you and willing to pray for you day and night just because you have a little cold and you're acting like a baby should remind you that no one in the world will ever love you like them. No one. This is important to remind ourselves. Why? Because sometimes we get annoyed by them and by everything around them and by everything that everything and everything and everything. But if we're constantly reminding ourselves what the Ramban started his letter with, that yes, 
You have to listen to the Musaw of your father, but you also cannot forsake the teachings of your mother, the guidance of your mother. Even if sometimes your mother makes mistakes, even if your mother sometimes sounds some like she doesn't make any sense, even if your wife has an opinion that makes her sound crazy, even if your wife sometimes makes you crazy, in the end, that's you. That's your foundation. That crazy is you. That crazy is you. That foundation is you. And whatever you do with your parents, remember, it's measure for measure. Your children will do to you. You disconnect from them, you care less about your parents, guess what? Your kids will also care less about their parents. You send your parents to some nursing home that abuses people and never check in on them and care less about them, guess what? One day you'll be that. You'll be old. You'll be gray. And they'll send you, your kids are going to send you to some nursing home where they put you next to some dog. So, yes, it's difficult. But that's why the Chachamim say that honoring your parents, it's not just one of the foundational mitzvot of the Torah. It's also one of the most difficult mitzvot in the Torah. It's also one of the most difficult mitzvot in the Torah. But difficulty never absolved you. The fact that it's difficult, that's why there's a big reward for it. And the reward is not just eternity. It's also here. That's why it says when you honor your parents, you get a long life. Not just a long life eternally, but a long life here. A life that's worth living. It starts with respecting your mom. It starts with respecting your dad. It starts with realizing that by fulfilling that, fulfilling that mitzvah, you're actually sanctifying Hashem's name. You're honoring Hashem's name. Because the Chachamim explained the reason why the order of the Ten Commandments was given as such, because if you dishonor your parents, it's considered all five other sins that follow after. Murder, uh, the uh, stealing, uh, jealous, all the other five uh, Ten Commandments. If you dishonor your parents, you've just violated the other five. Dishonoring your parents, consider like you murdered them in cold blood. Not supporting them, you have money, they need money, you're not willing to help them. It's considered like you stole. And so on and so forth. Why? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, they gave you life, you disconnect from that. That means you'll disconnect from me at some point also. You can't respect that, you can't respect me. So, this is a little bit of a reminder for us to, number one, respect and honor what we have. Number two, realize that whatever we invest into our children, eventually, eventually that's going to be something that we could speak of. Either we're going to speak badly about it or we're going to speak good about it. If you invest like Hannah, you can have children like Hannah. I don't know how many people in this generation can do what the seven-year-old did. I don't know how many people could do it. I'm sure there's at least 36 of them that could do it. But I don't know how many more than that. Our goal as Jews is to have kids just like Hannah. Where those kids learn enough about Yirat Shemaim, learn enough about reward and punishment, that if Chas Shalom, the test was ever given, we know we would be able to pass. Hopefully we never have such a test. But you have to educate your kids and yourself and prepare for that. Because that's the generation we live. We live in such a generation. We live in a generation of Mashiach. We live in a generation where there's going to be a lot of ups and downs, a lot of craziness, a lot of Yetzirah. You have to prepare for it. Sometimes the Yetzirah comes knocking on your door, Sometimes it's a tank. You have to prepare for everything. It starts with educating ourselves. It starts with applying everything to ourselves. If you learn Yilat Shemayim, your kids will have Yilat Shemayim. You value learning, your kids will value learning. The wife sends the husband to go to a shiur Torah at night, the kids are going to want to go to a shiur Torah at night. The wife values Torah, the husband values Torah. Husband and wife value Torah, the kids will value Torah, and so on and so forth. Once people understand that every one of their actions has a consequence, has a reward, has everything that is going to 
materialize in this world, then they could live a life that Bezat Hashem is worth living. Any questions? Keeping Shabbat is, yes, I mean, it's a, uh, it's both a two separate mitzvot. If your parents tell you to violate Shabbat or any mitzvah in the Torah, you're not allowed to listen to them. You're not allowed to listen to them. But if uh, your uh, parents are, have a life risk, then obviously you're obligated to violate Shabbat in order to save their life. Also, honoring parents is different than for men and women. You should also know that. It's different. While you're living in your parents' home, you're both obligated. Men and women, the son and daughter, are obligated to honor the parents. But the son is the only one that's obligated with honoring the parents forever, whereas the daughter is only obligated to do it as long as she's living in their house. Once the daughter is married, then she's obligated to our husband first, and only secondary to our parents. If she gets divorced, then she's back to having to honor, honor her parents first. But if she's married, she has to honor her husband before she honors her parents. Her husband takes precedence. This, I know, is probably not going to be music to some women's ears or men's ears that uh, you know, love their parents and maybe not so much their husband. But the reality is that once a woman gets married, she has to know that the uh, husband becomes the number one. A woman that makes her husband number one will have a happy marriage. A woman that makes her husband you know, somewhere different than number one where the kids are number one or the parents are number one or work is number one that woman is either going to have a miserable life or just a lonely life because she'll be divorced you know you have the same thing with the husband if the husband makes his family number one his wife number one he'll be a happy husband if he makes the wife something different where they're you know she's after his parents she's after the kids she's after money she's after the stock market She's after all these different things, then obviously she's going to know it, and she's not going to like it, and uh, she'll reciprocate. She'll reciprocate, and he'll be a miserable or most likely lonely person. So yes, the Torah obligates us to honor our parents, but there's conditions to things. But nonetheless, if every single person simply worries about the, their spouse, their, the person that's next to them, the person that's near them, the person that's dear to them, you're never going to have any problems. But if a person only worries about themselves, then they're always going to have problems. Anything else? Yes. Okay, tomorrow night we have the uh, questions and answers uh, series. Uh, next week, I'm not going to be here on Tuesday. So next week we have a shiur on uh, Sunday and uh, no shiur on Tuesday. And as far as Wednesday, Bezot Hashem, I'm going to try. I land on Wednesday, but and I'll try Bezot Hashem to do a shiur on Wednesday. But uh, Bezot Hashem, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Amen ve'amen.